Hey, everyone. Just want to let you know that if you like Danger Close, be sure to follow at This Is Ironclad on Instagram, YouTube, and all major platforms. They're the team that produces Danger Close and all of the trailers for the Terminal List novels. They also produce and distribute more great content like Change Agents with Andy Stumpf, which I executive produce, Oil & Whiskey with Roadster Shop, which features guests including Joe Rogan, Jesse James, and others, and the behind-the-scene filmmaking series Into the Fray, and a bunch more. Into the Fray recently broke down the making of the trailer for my latest novel, Only the Dead, starring my friend and teammate Dom Rasso as James Reese. Remember, that's at This Is Ironclad on YouTube and Instagram. This is the Danger Close Podcast. Beyond the books with me, Jack Carr. Welcome to the Danger Close Podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My latest novel, Only the Dead, is on shelves right now. My guest today, Lucas O'Hara. Lucas is an Army veteran, a blacksmith and blade maker of Grizzly Forge. And now, without further ado, here's Lucas O'Hara. Lucas, what's up, man? What's up, brother? Good How to you see doing? you. Thank Good you for coming you up. Oh, it's such a pleasure and an honor. Man, oh, man. My, oh, pleasure and honor all mine. And I wanted to catch you before you took off for Washington Next State. Step. Next yeah. year. Yeah, yeah, that's why. I'm not sure when this is going to drop, so you might already be there by the time this drops. But you've been here for a couple of years now in yeah, Utah, and you're years. about to take off and head up to Washington State and yep. reopen the shop up there, Grizzly Forge. Um, so I want to get into to all that. But uh, truck's looking good, by the way. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate you it. You liking that? Loving it. Did you build it's it all been, the way up or did you get it? Build it. Nope. Started from scratch. It was a white F-150 when I got it. Oh. And then actually Mike was one of the first ones before I even moved up here, Black Rifle and all that. Uh, I had listened to a podcast with Mike Glover. who was talking about overlanding and being preparedness yeah. and all that, and especially vehicle size. <clears throat> this was right before COVID. So uh, I'd actually been talking to him and he helped me, you know, kind of figure out what truck I should get and all that. Really? Kind of told me how to start building it. And then I just nice. went down the rabbit hole and still am pretty far down it. No Wish way. I was doing a lot more in that world. But sadly, you know, works just kind of, we didn't get to go out almost at all this year in camp and, yeah. you know, get to do much. I normally do all the overland expos and all that as well. Okay. But sadly, just had to take a little back burner for a while. Just being so busy. God bless, man. It's been a lot. Just, That's you know, awesome. really focusing on the business focusing on the family, that kind of stuff, yeah. kind of getting my priorities set. But, you know, the move's going to open up a lot of more free time. Okay. So we'll be going up. And there's so many national parks. There's like 120 national parks in Washington. It's beautiful up there. Gosh, Gosh it's so beautiful up there. I love when the SEAL team's going up there and doing the, uh, our, like some mountain warfare training stuff um, at Fort Lewis. And I remember my first time in there, jumping in at night, static line, uh, back in the days before uh, we had nods. It was mm -hmm. just like the point man was the only guy that had a nod, uh, had a a, a, a night optical device and it was on his m4 type of a thing you know so scanning walking all that stuff but the ground was frozen and it was raining so that, i remember the whole time so that's gonna be the snow. different thing is the rain <laughs> the rain is I gonna love be a rain, little man. and you see i feel i say that now it's hard to say it without living there yet yeah. it rains a good bit in georgia we're originally from georgia and we would get some pretty heavy rain especially in the spring but from what i heard it's a good nine to ten months of just straight rain and gloom but i'm kind of excited excited about that utah's yeah. been just so sunny yeah and to be honest we really miss thunderstorms and yeah. rain when we moved out here uh -huh. so it'll be nice to kind of get that but uh yeah we're excited we're getting a little getting the sauna set up the ice plunge some you know uv lights just so we can still kind of get that kind of stuff and stay mentally okay. happy yeah while we're out there because i mean i heard the winter times it gets dark at like 3 30 don't people you have know? some syndrome isn't there something called like so sad or something like Just, that. I have and no it's called idea. Like, I'm sure I guarantee there something is like that. <laughs> like when we went up last year, we went up during the summer and you know, there was just a whole bunch of people out enjoying cause they have three months. I mean, there's no be more beautiful state than Washington in the summer. It's I mean, so I didn't beautiful. know green existed yeah. that green. Yeah. But everyone was walking around in, you know, T-shirts and shorts, and they just look translucent. Yeah. <laughs> <You know? laughs> it's awesome. And it's, uh, I love it up there. It's so beautiful. But that Fort Lewis, that one I was talking about when the ground was frozen, and it was raining the whole time. That was December, I think. Or no, no, mm. it was January or February. Uh, and then I went another time in August, like mid-August. Oh my gosh, so beautiful. Because so, yeah, we did a week incredible. last summer, and we're just blown away with how gorgeous it was. Yeah. 
Yeah, that's amazing. Uh, but I'm loving the truck. And Thank you have the you. decked in the back there? Absolutely. So you got the yeah, decked in my there? Favorite, my favorite people on earth. Okay. I, actually, the decked was the first thing I bought. Okay. Um, the decked was the first thing that I did to my truck mm -hmm. after <clears throat> they got the lift. So I bought it, took it straight to the dealership. Like I bought it, went off the lot and went straight, dropped it off, got the lift, whole truck's line x so mm -hmm. Line X in Rome, Georgia did that, sprayed the whole yeah. thing. Because I just wanted to be tough. It's a bigger truck. Mm -hmm. I knew I'd be running a lot of chainsaw trails and mm -hmm. really tight Scratching trails. That's up. the one negative thing of the having truck, a full yeah. size. Wish I could fit in a Tacoma or a little uh, Toyota. <laughs> I just don't fit in a... Yeah. And we do it with the family. I'm not trying to do another hobby that they don't get to be a part of. Right. So I had to have something that the girls and the wife could fit in. But yeah, so did that. And then after that, it was just slowly over time. I mean, I've been building it for almost four and a half years now. Nice. What, what lights did day. you go with? Did you stick with one? Um, I went with the Halon, like the, I'm pretty sure they're called Halon by Halo Systems. They do the, that's my front lights. And then all the other lights are KC. Okay. Um, partnered up with KC about a year ago now. Oh, nice. Nice. I have some stuff on KC and coming on the, uh, on the, the Ram power wagon. I think I'm doing uh ditch lights. I'm dropping that off here pretty soon. Over oh, you got a power wagon? Yeah. <sighs> See, I was looking, that was something when the power wagon came out, I mean, that was the talk of the town of the Overland Expo two years ago. Oh yeah. I mean, it was just power wagons everywhere. And oh, I was really? actually blown away with how amazing that truck is. And I'm not a Dodge guy. Yeah. <laughs> and I was shocked at how gorgeous that truck was. Yeah. It's pretty, I mean, it's nice. It's kind of like out of the box. You know, I like that. Like kind of like uh, if you're going with Toyota and you do the TRD pro, like out of the box, it's pretty good to go. Yep. Yeah. Add some lights, add a couple things and you're, and you're good. But um, kind of like you don't like a, like a SIG out of the box. It already has uh, night sights on there. Like pretty good and to that's go. That's amazing. You know? Uh, so I like how trucks like that as well. So um, my daughter took my, my forerunner after I got it all decked out from it's just it's that thing's awesome i need to clone it and, and get another one because i do love that tacoma i mean you're not going to fit in it but um it's I mean, just, once again out of the box it's right, like one of the best one of the best i mean i love it i want to get another one before they change it because they're going to change it up this next year and i'm yep. worried it's going to be too uh too high tech uh that that power the, the power wagon is actually a little too high tech really yeah it's uh i wish they had kept it a little more old school like i love to be able to reach through the window you know and just like turn the key and not a tap oh got to have my foot on the brake in order to turn the key uh like that sort of thing like just some old school stuff like that or not have a computer screen that i need to uh, adjust temperature and everything with see i don't just, i like knobs I'm yeah i like guy exactly i, I love I pressing the buttons i love the knobs key. yep i love the key so the power the uh trd pros still have the key or at least they nice. did so i uh, so i like that so the key still had buttons to press like Perfect. Like just the right mixture, I think, of modern and then old school. So I do like that. So that power wagon, it's the 75th anniversary edition. Um, I'm putting ditch lights on it and then a couple a couple lights down low because it gets pretty dark up here coming See, up. See, that's something with the fog already in our time in Washington, just the different climates. <clears throat> I need to change out, go ambers, get more low light, stuff mm -hmm. like that, because the fog is pretty nuts in the morning. Yeah. You know, and I'm not set up for that at all. All my okay. lights are pretty high right now. Mm -hmm. Everything's on the hood or on the roof. So yeah. I need to do a quick little few adjustments on that. But I've just been still waiting to get a bumper. I don't have a good bumper on it because I didn't want one of those big bull guards like the okay. rancher style. I wanted something more low key, lighter, yeah. something a good winch can hook on. Yep. Yeah, we haven't the, really found we anything do? I liked. C four fabrication, I think, the is best. what we did on my uh, on my daughter's. C four, they're the greatest. What's now my daughter's. Um, so it's nice because you have different options. Like yep. I forget what they call it, like high, medium, or low, or something like that. So uh, hers has that medium, so it's not it doesn't stick out, you know, too much. But you can still get that winch under there. It's kind of like the hidden winch. I'm not sure if it's actually hidden winch, but it's more not as just out mm -hmm. there, big and yeah. bold. Yeah, my truck's already pretty heavy. So but if yours I've can handle a, it, yours can handle it. When you start throwing all that weight on a Tacoma or a Forerunner, like you know, they start struggling. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, but yeah, hers so C4 and it, and it looks good, looks smooth. I uh, really like how that how it blends in. But that uh, full on rancher style is nice when you hit an elk or a moose for sure. You know, for sure. So if you're in Montana, Idaho, even places around here, Wyoming, I think I'd go but big like that. And I would agree with that, especially if I was doing like early morning drives or yep. night drives or stuff. Mm -hmm. It's kind of, I kind of set things up as the scenario dictates, like nice. try not to hit everything at once. <laughs> just what do I need here? Yeah. And then if I move, kind of adjust it nice. try not to spend all the money in the world. I already put a good bit. Of yeah, it. it gets, it gets pricey. That's for sure. Uh, I can't decide. So I had this I, and I love my uh, 97 uh, Land Cruiser because it's like that perfect blend, I think mm -hmm. of old school. And just like before things got a little too modern, so obviously you're turning a key and you're pressing buttons and all that stuff. There's no screen. Uh, so I do love that, but I can't decide how much I want to, cause it's pretty, I mean, it's pretty stock. I mean, it is stock, uh, but it's the triple locked. Um, but I don't know if I should just keep it 
like that and go look for another one that I can, yeah. you know, add a bunch of stuff to. Um, cause it's harder and harder to find them that people haven't chopped up yet. So exactly. I don't, so I don't know, but I do love that combination, but I'm a sucker for the, uh, anniversary editions of things. So the, <laughs> the, the power wagons, the 75th, um, nice. and then the 40th anniversary for the, uh, for the, uh, land cruiser. And then I have a, a BMW bike too. That's an anniversary edition. So I'm just a sucker for the anniversary editions. I'm, just, I'm a sucker for things that not a lot of people have. Yeah. <laughs> I like, yeah. I like those little things. That's a little bit special that, you know, so I, I, I feel that I was born. I think Toyota came out with the forest green two years ago now. And I almost, cause I, I was the only time that they were going to do that color. Mm. And I almost got rid of my truck just because just of, that. of that. Just cause it was such a beautiful green. Yeah. And I'm a sucker for forest green. Yeah, you can go back like, and still those those more recent ones you can still grab, but as they get older and older, older and people start chopping them up and adding yep. things and you know messing them up, it gets it gets harder and harder. So anyway, yeah. So the car that with the the Dodge or the the Ram is in the shop today, just getting the winter tires off because it had the studs on there. Yep. So I think I'm a little past overdue here but it, but we had snow on the roads and ice on the roads so a little longer than than normal out here this you year, still got so. a good bit of snow out here up here we do and it's and it's melted a ton since uh just last week i know i saw the it's photos. Uh, it was, it's I was wild blown away with the amount of snow it was cool it's to wild. get to live here for this this year yeah. to get to witness right i mean coming from georgia the most snow i'd ever seen was the blizzard of 93 we got yeah. 11 inches in 1993 okay and it was just wild and then yeah. we had the snow apocalypse in i think 2015 <laughs> where it was two inches of ice yeah and shut the city down for almost five days and that was the most unrest i'd ever seen in my yeah. life like there was close to four thousand vehicles just abandoned wow. on highways like i Jeez. walked 14 miles that night yeah um because i had to abandon my vehicle because i mean people were stuck in miles. traffic for almost 20 hours Dang. <clears throat> and i was booting cars in atlanta at the time and when the storm hit my boss was finally like hey man get out of here and it took me seven hours to go a mile and a half trying to get out of the city, started taking back roads, but the ice had already built up so much. And I was in a little bitty Ford Focus at the time, drove a Ford Focus for 13 years, 300,000 miles, saving what? to buy my truck. 300,000 miles on a Ford Focus? A little Ford Focus, I had it for Dang. 13 years. Was did you take care of it or did you oh, like I beat it? I took great care of it. Yeah, okay. Took great care of it. That's why I stuck with Ford, just because I was so blown away with that. I, first car was a Ford Ranger, nice. then the Focus, and had a few others in between. But um, yeah, wow. ended up having to abandon it and you know print out my phone died had gps ended up walking close to 10 miles then my phone died because it was so cold out and in between those 10 miles was trying to help as much as i could because i mean there was wrecks every quarter mile roughly was just some severe wreck just because yeah. everything was so bad uh, we have these big transport buses in atlanta one had flipped over you know that was pretty rough helped two people set broken arms on that oh my gosh um, but it was getting so dark and so cold and like police couldn't get anywhere ambulances couldn't get anywhere and i had broken up such a sweat from walking that finally i couldn't stop and help anymore just because i had to keep going myself yeah, to freeze. get to the house but had to take like a two mile detour because my phone died and i no longer had maps so i had to find a hotel that was still open print off actual old school map quest directions to my buddy's right. house but yeah Dang. it took me over almost eight hours to get to the house and then we were stuck there for two days no because no one could move around because all the cars were abandoned it was oh one of the most gosh. wild Wild things I've ever seen. Dude, how many people didn't make it through that? Um, I actually don't know. I was pretty young at the time, so I yeah. wasn't really paying attention to stuff like that. I was in my early 20s. It was right when I got out of the military. It, right? Yeah, so I guarantee a few did. It wasn't it was that cold. It was just you couldn't move yeah. because Atlanta, we're not prepared for any of that. Right. So it was just a solid two and a half inches of ice Dang. on everything. So oh, it yeah. wasn't even snow. It was yeah, just yeah. ice and you just couldn't move. Dang. And then people just didn't know what to do. I mean, the photos from it are pretty wild. Oh, man. I mean, it looks like something out of Walking Dead. Jeez. Well, we had, what, Buffalo, New York this last year? Is that when everybody was trapped in their See, cars? See, that was a lot scarier because the temperature drop in the snow and yeah. you couldn't see. This was just ice. Man. So I keep the little, a little field craft bag, little small one there, stuff with uh, uh, socks, hats, puffy jacket, That's puffy pants. Uh, yeah, I have some, I have the uh, jet fuel or uh, jet oil in there, uh, a little bit of food, uh, a little water in a, in a uh, insulated uh, kind of case thing for it from, I think from OR and, uh, and some hand warmers and stuff, sleeping bag, uh, got all that stuff in there in the back and then the the max tracks oh the max tracks around here Curtis. max tracks and a shovel it's all you like need. that's pretty good that's like, why i haven't had a winch on my truck this whole time and i've yeah. been able to get out of everything with max tracks and a shovel. yeah that's around around here too i mean it's nice to have a toe strap and a uh, snatch strap and stuff like that if you, yep. you need to but uh but with that with those max tracks and the um uh and the shovel 
like you're pretty good yeah. on a lot of things. But uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, so I like to be prepared. And then coming up here, people are sliding off the road all the time. I've been blown away with how many people don't know how to drive. Like when we yeah. moved up here, we assumed that Salt Lake, Mountain, Snow, mm -hmm. people would be a little bit more prepared. But yeah. even down in uh, West Jordan where we live, that last snow, we got those three feet a few, maybe a month or so ago. Yeah. Like I still drove to work and everything, but. I was blown away with the disregard for weather. Mm -hmm. I just getting out of my neighborhood, I had to help almost, I think it was five or six cars. Really? And I mean, half of them had families and kids in them oh, wow. and they're just stuck in the middle of the road. They're driving a Honda Civic with three feet of snow and just bottoming out. And yeah. finally again, just had to stop helping because I just, it kind of blows my mind how people just don't think about that and they'll just take off, especially with their kids and stuff in the car. And it's like, man, if I hadn't stopped or helped, he yeah. could have been in a bit of a rough, rough situation. Right. Right. But yeah. It's pretty, it's different out here. It's wild. Yep. Gotta have the, gotta have the chains, gotta have the max tracks, gotta have the shovel, gotta have a toe strap, snatch strap, uh, some shackles, a few other little things in there to help some, some food, some water, some warm clothes. And, you know, just, just thinking ahead, you know, we get so used to that just down being able to dial 911, um, yeah. like, oh, I'll just, I'll just call. Uh, well, maybe not. Doesn't, maybe not doesn't really but i think down by where you are maybe it's uh people think they're so close to civilization yep. yeah and that's kind of how i figured that's kind of what i thought it yeah, was just, just people assuming that somebody would be there to help yeah that's probably the mindset i'm so close to salt lake i'm so i'm down lower I'm, I'm i'm so close to these things so they don't think constantly about just being remote and if uh you know you just have to be prepared well, and a lot of, I mean, two of the cars that we helped, they didn't even get out. Like they just stayed and people were just bummed. And I was like, man, I'd be kind of embarrassed if I got stuck or something. Like I'd go out of my way to get out and, you know, thank you so much. I probably should have done that. My bad, you know, anything right. like that. And they, they just didn't. assumed that somebody would help push them and oh just went on with their day. And it was, really? just, it was pretty wild. It was, I don't know. It's a bit of an eye opener. It kind of changes things with the way the world is right yeah. now. If things kind of hit the fan, it's one of those, yeah. like, I'm kind of a, I kind of have that heart to want to help as yeah. much as I can, but it was a uh, first time I kind of thought about that. Like, man, I could almost put, if it really got bad, it would almost put my family in more danger, me stopping and trying to help than yeah. actually just cruising. Yeah. So it was a kind of different mindset that I'd have to think about it. Cause it's weird for me to see something that I could help with and move by. I know. And I just, I feel like a lot of people nowadays are kind of just expecting someone like us or people yeah. in our community to be the ones to stop and help. Right. Kind of like when COVID happened, all the texts I got like, do you have extra gun? Yep. Do you, exactly. You from California. For how people you, in California. I mean, exactly. even in Georgia, we were in Georgia for that. And I couldn't tell you how many of my friends just really, hey man, you know, we're a little, we can't really get anything. Like it wasn't just a California thing. It was oh, just, man you know, people in general. Oh, yeah, it was surprising. How, wait, I shouldn't, I shouldn't say that. It was not surprising uh, in one sense how many people in California called to ask if they could uh, borrow a gun or, or say, hey, why can't you, uh, why can't I just walk in? I thought I could just walk in and walk out with one. Uh, yeah, okay. And then also they're shutting things down, you know? I mean, it, yep. Yeah, I just want to stay up here. I just yeah. want to stay up here. Yeah, I'm going to have to go more remote at some point, though. But with kids and our we have middle child with really severe special needs, and so yep. he's, like, close to a lot of things in here. He has a lot of people that love him up here. They take him uh, to do cool things each day and all that. So that would be harder to do if we were more remote. 100%. So that's just kind of how it is. But, uh, you know, I, I like I like being out there. I like being. I'm the same way. The <laughs> wife and I will probably disappear somewhere <laughs> once the girls grow up, but they're five and four and yeah. they're going to be hitting that real school age soon. And I still want them to get that. I still want them to get to be social and be able yeah. to do stuff with their friends. Just keep it a little bit smaller. Just find a really good community. We haven't decided yet. Well, we're end up for them to go yeah. through elementary, middle and high school. Right. But <clears throat> there's a lot of options. We've lived just about everywhere now, you know, Man. different climate wise. So yeah. just got to figure out what's that's going to be. If it's going to be East coast, the West or, you know, out, okay. out in Washington. So Washington's going to be a test. Yeah, Washington's yeah. definitely a test. Um, Washington's got a few laws we're not the world's biggest fans of, especially recently. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I just don't like the government interfering in my stuff too much. And especially when it comes to my children. Guns and other things I can kind of deal with. I've kind of skirted some stuff in my, my yeah. past with that anyway. So that really doesn't bother me. But when it starts affecting my children and uh, it starts, you know, especially having daughters, it kind of changes. If I had sons, I like to think that I could raise them strong enough that they could kind of navigate all that. Yeah. Um, but having a daughter these days is just a touch terrifying. Like yeah. what young women go through, especially with, uh, you know, image issues and, and social media and just stuff, all man. of that stuff. I just really want to raise strong women and be in a place where I can raise some really awesome daughters. 
that, yeah. you know, are tough and, and, and can figure life out and be free thinkers and, and figure their own stuff out without doing stuff because everyone else is doing it. Yeah. <clears throat> so just being focused on raising, raising strong women is probably my biggest, biggest thing right now. Right. Even why I mean Washington, man, that uh, it's so hard to stay up to date with all the changes in gun it laws. Really like is. I think we have till the end of May for like the bump stock stuff. And did you see the exchange? I just saw little clips of it on uh, uh, in Washington uh, talking to the AT- director of the ATF and some of congressman was talking to them and asking them about uh, hey, so people have till the end of May until they become felons. And he's like, well, I mean, he had horrible answers for everything. He wasn't really even sure what he was talking about. It's the head of the head of the ATF. Is that for the bump stock or? Is at the pistol braces it's brace, brace i think and the uh, congressman like held up this piece of plastic he's like so someone bought this le- a thing legally but in x number of days they're going to be a f- felon is that right if they have this piece of plastic on their rifle and he was like well uh, yes you know like oh man and you gotta stay you gotta stay on top of it like a lot of people yeah. probably are just disconnected and don't even care about what's going on in in dc or anywhere else yeah. and all of a sudden they're gonna gonna be surprised that they're, they're a felon uh in x number of days yep it's, it's wild it's wild it really is it's a oh man i don't it's hard it's hard to kind of pay attention to it. it's hard not to get sucked into it and kind of feel like it's a losing battle i've almost kind of Brought everything in, made my world a little bit smaller. That's one of the big things about this move. It'll be nice to be tucked away somewhere rolling into the next mm-hmm. round of elections. Mm-hmm. And it's just, it's kind of a terrifying feeling to know you have almost no control. Like we can all talk about it all day long and have the logic and see everything laid out before us. Yeah. But it sucks when you know it's like the most ultimate gaslighting when you're like, I know this is not right. Like it's this so is this, 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 this. You're completely, especially with contradictions, that drives me nuts. It's so crazy. And it's like you're contradicting everything you're saying, but what can we do about it? And it's, that's, uh, that's the rough of we vote, you know, I'm a stay on top of all that, trying to yeah. keep up with everything, but it's just moving so quickly. Yeah. You really know, is. and all the stuff Tulsi has been talking about lately with all that has just been mind blowingly terrifying too. Yeah. She's, uh, she's been fantastic. Yeah. Um, Amazing. But let's talk about your, your, uh, your path into the military. Yes, Where sir. did you grow up? And were you, did you grow up hunting, fishing, outdoors, around <sighs> weapons and knives? And yeah. did, when a little kid, were you shaping knives How and carving it? sticks and all Bow that stuff? Bow and arrows, swords nice. with the rubber bands. There, and yeah. Whole nine nice. yards. I love so, it. I love it. Uh, born and raised in Georgia, uh, Marietta, Georgia. Um, one of six children. Uh, Raised, raised a little different. My childhood story is a little different. My father was a master electrician, construction worker for his, for his life. Um, grew up, born and raised. Actually, he was born in Germany. It's a pretty crazy story. But uh, my grandfather was a major general in the Air Force and adopted my dad at the end of World War II. So my dad was born in Bremerhaven, Germany. Um, his name was Hans Jürgen Schultz and got switched to William Patrick O'Hara. He was adopted at six weeks old. And uh, my grandfather, who is from Ireland, my grandmother's from England, um, adopted my dad, brought him down to Tampa, Florida. And that's where he was raised from six weeks up. My dad was a six, six German. Uh, my grandfather was maybe five foot two. My grandmother about the same. My dad has a photo in high school of his arms out and the entire family under his arms. No way. So I actually don't have a drop of Irish blood in me. It's almost all German and Scandinavian. No way. How did they, how did they find, like, how did that come about? Um, it was something they were asking from, and this is all, the other thing is, I'm fast forwarding a little bit. My dad was killed in 2013 by a drunk driver. So I didn't really get a lot of, I was just hitting that age where I could really start talking to him and understanding a lot. And he wasn't a big fan of talking about all that. When he passed away, maybe 10 years ago, I hired a private investigator, spent a good bit of money to just, cause I wanted to know mm-hmm. for myself. I had done that 23 and me thing. And mm-hmm. I just kind of want to know about his past and, and where he, where he had come from, found out that, uh, my real grandfather was actually a SS officer, um, had raped my grandmother who was a milkmaid in a town. And then she was pregnant and then gave up the child for adoption, left my dad on uh, the orphanage steps. Um, what? And then they had known who she was, went back, got her to fill out all the paperwork and everything, which is how we were even, but I was able to get the adoption papers, all of that. Uh, it took about six months to find everything, but what? Yeah, it was pretty wild. That is insane. <clears throat> yeah. How, how did that even like, how did they even 
like, was there a program back then at the end of World War II to uh, adopt? I don't know. Uh, so I don't know the or... whole story. From what I was told growing up, is they were just asking officers if anyone had wanted to adopt German orphans, and I guess my grandfather and grandmother decided to. They had already had two kids of their own. Um, there's a lot of there was a lot of family stuff mixed in there. Um, feel like there was a little bit of regret. Uh, uh, adopting my dad my dad didn't have a really close relationship with his family until mm. literally the year he died no so way. it was one of the first times i'd really got to meet my uncle and aunt and like get to talk to them because there was just a lot of stuff mixed in there um mm. with him just being treated a little bit different from what yeah. i could pick on from his other brother and sister who were right. biological so dad moved to atlanta um did they have when did they come after world war ii so it's uk <laughs> officer and uh an irish uh mother and how did they get to the, the U.S.? What, what was that? Uh, U.S., so from my understanding, they were already here. Um, they were older, too. So my grandfather died in his 90s, and that would have been in the 90s. So they were already much older. He was a major general when he adopted them. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so I don't, I don't know too much about that. I only got to meet my grandparents maybe seven or eight times mm -hmm. um, throughout my life, especially once my dad passed. I would never, I didn't see him again. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, there's a little bit of family stuff mixed in there, but he met my mom in, uh, Waynesville, North Carolina. That's where she's from. My dad, when he grew up, moved out of Florida and moved up to North Carolina, they met, then they moved down to Atlanta during the boom for construction. So Dang. my dad, you know, he did the CNN center down there. He wired the King and Queen building. You know, he was a big role. He did uh, everything for, um, the Olympics when they came yeah. in. Um, he was in charge of building Centennial Olympic Park. So uh, oh, wow. he was uh, really successful in that in that world, but it's still, he's a construction worker at the end of the day. Wow. So I didn't even have my first bedroom until I joined the military. It was the first time I got my first bedroom. Okay. So we had a little bitty two, well, I guess it would have been three bedroom house. Mm -hmm. So me and my three brothers in one, me and my three sisters in another. Raised super, super religious, very sheltered. Um, my mom was a, used faith pretty heavily to hide a lot of things wrong in her life. Um, it was one of those where one minute everything's good. The next minute, you know, I'm allowed to play with star Wars toys. Then, you know, a month goes by and it's like, that's from the devil and all my toys get destroyed. That kind of stuff, you know, just really, really sheltered. So after dad passed away, um, just, I, I didn't have much of that guidance anymore. Kind of went off the deep end. Nothing crazy because remember, I'm still super sheltered. All my friends are church kids. I don't really get out too much. Uh, played lacrosse for a public school. So I got into lacrosse. Um, nice. Got to get a little bit of socialization through that. But my mom and I just kept butting heads because I just wanted to be normal. Yeah. I just wanted to have normal friends. I just wanted to do something. Um, and then joined the army at 17. Uh, she signed all my paperwork just to kind of get me out. Joined the army and then i got <clears throat> a really bad case of mono which uh almost killed me what um like in boot camp mono. or something no it was right before leading up before. to it so i was in the delayed entry program two weeks before shipping off to basic i got mono uh got mono was down for almost six months six uh, months got down to 138 pounds was my lowest at six foot six uh and then Whoa. i went back in when i went to basic i was 145 pounds Dang. 145 pounds at six foot six. Uh, I was Whoa. on the weight gain program. So I had to gain 20 pounds of weight before I was allowed to graduate. No way. Which made, what did they do at boot camp for that? Made my, made my basic pretty miserable. Um, so as you know, when you go in, it's the rush, rush, hurry, scream. And this is 2000, 2005, okay. 2000, end of 2005, going into 2006 uh, when I joined. And um, I got front loaded. I got 30 minutes to eat cheeseburgers, ice cream, every oh bit of food my you can goodness. imagine, all of that. Obviously oh. not making me the most popular person alive with everyone who's actually in the barracks. Oh. Um, got to the point where- How many after, people were with you? There's like, it was like a group of kids that needed no, to No, I that. was the only one on weight gain. What? Yeah, I was the only one on weight gain and then we had two fatties that had to drop down. <laughs> Yeah. What do they do with them? Just not feed they them? They just and don't like feed them and feeds, run them. Oh. Yeah, no, it's, it's, I, I felt bad for them. Oh. Way worse. It was, That's, well, yeah. Okay, I, I don't know which was worse. So what got bad is after a lot of times after chow, you get a nice little smoke session. Hmm. The problem was I was oh, eating. For so, those listening, a smoke session is just uh, PT getting yelled at, push-ups, yeah, sit-ups. Yeah, push-ups, sit-ups, sprinting stuff. down to the tank, running back, mm -hmm. stuff like that. And uh, the problem was I was eating so much food that oh, I was vomiting all of it, it up yeah. right after. So then 
Private O'Hara got to carry around a folding chair. And I didn't get smoked for an hour and a half after every meal. So while everybody else is getting messed with, I'm sitting in a lawn chair watching them. What? So, That's crazy. And this is after my drill sergeant tells me, the, the one bit of advice I can tell you is just don't, as long as they don't know your name, you're doing good. Mm. Everybody knew my name by day two. Yeah, I mean, you're the only kid in the lawn chair. weird little homeschool kid stuff. from, you know, Georgia. And the worst part is I just wanted to fit in. So yeah. I was overly trying right. to be something that I wasn't, like just trying to find something in common with all my bunk mates and got picked on pretty heavy and basic. But then week two, we got a guy who had come in from New York. He used to be a Latin king in New York. So he was on that gang rehabilitation program where he left his gangs and joined the army. So it was either prison or join the army. So I got this maybe six foot two, 280 black guy from New York City who was a bona fide Latin king. And he and I became incredibly close friends and kind of stuck up for me the rest of basic, no way. Um, which was really, really awesome. Kind of changed a lot for me in that. You know, a lot of guys were messing with me pretty hard in the beginning. But then once they got to know me a little bit better, and I mean, it wasn't my fault. It's just, I was an easy target. Uh, especially at that time. Interesting. Because um, looking of, at you today, I would never assume that. Um, well, you're because, looking at me at 270 yeah. <laughs> pounds. <laughs> I'd be like, no, I think I'm going to avoid this person. If you saw, if you saw photos of me when I joined, it would you wouldn't even recognize me. Wow. I was a kid. I mean, I was I was literally a kid. Which looking back now is mind blowing. That is wild. You know, you know I want to ask you a, a question about your MOS and boot camp here in a second. 100%. But before I forget, um, when you had that private investigator go back and look, find out that past about your family. Did you find out what happened to that SS officer? Or did he Nothing. make it through the war? All, all they only knew, and even the name, they only had his rank and last name. Really? So I don't know. I know nothing. So don't know if he that. was killed. Don't know if he I mean, we can only survived <laughs> and uh, yeah, and then then hid away. Not a clue. Yeah. Not a clue. I didn't go too far into that. I was more focused mm. on just trying to figure out where my dad had come from. Dang. You know that kind of stuff. That's so wild. What, uh, so you, you when you join the army, do you get your MOS going in? Do yep, you know? 11 Bravo with a RIP contract. Okay. So I knew I always wanted to be a sniper. Randy Shugart and Gary Gordon were my heroes wow. growing up. Um, always loved shooting. I was raised around guns. I shot my first gun at five, killed my first bear at eight in Whoa. North Carolina. Yeah, so- Dang, uh, with what? What'd you use? Uh, for the bear, use a 30 out six. And North Carolina, we do things a little bit different. We use dogs. So everything in North Carolina, all my bear hunting North Carolina is with dogs. Dogs, mm -hmm. And then you tree them and go that route. So I grew up like squirrel hunting, coon hunting, bear hunting, mainly mm -hmm. bear hunting was my, that was what I fell in love with. Yeah. So, uh, got into hunting pretty heavily. And then when my dad passed away, uh, I never got the opportunity to hunt with him. I had done all of that with my grandfather and all that. And then mm -hmm. when he passed away, we were lucky to be members of a pretty awesome church, actually, mm -hmm. that I got involved with, not so much for the religious side, but it was one of those mega churches mm -hmm. where they had massive outreach programs. Okay. So I got to go to Alaska six times with that church, what? building camps up there, went to Mexico. I was on a hurricane relief team what? where when massive storms hit, we would load up, pack everything up, and then take off for two months. Whoa. and just go work on that. I was actually amazing. choir ensemble, like did all that. I was mm -hmm. on a dance team, like anything that I could do active to get out of my house mm -hmm. and be a part of and feel like I was giving back in some yeah. way. That's just kind of always been me since a kid. Okay. And that's not tooting my own horn or anything. It's yeah. just like, I like to feel like I'm making, doing something positive somewhere in life. Dude, six times to Alaska. <clears throat> six times uh, up to Kaufman Cove. There's a little bitty place of Kaufman. So you fly out of Atlanta, Seattle, Seattle, Ketchikan, Ketchikan. You take a ferry to Cloak, And then from Cloak, you take a little bitty floater plane to Kaufman Cove. Whoa. Kaufman Cove is this little bitty island uh, down in the panhandle of Alaska. Mm. So this is Alaska. Kaufman Cove's like down here in the islands. Like Admiralty Islands? Um, I wish I could tell you the exact location, but it's Somewhere just down there, yep, okay. down there wow. tucked in. Amazing. Um, beautiful little island wow. and I just fell in love with it and just spent my summers there going back working on it because they were building a camp out there to take inner city kids mm -hmm. bring them out there so that they could actually be a part of Alaska and it was we were building this eight cabin camp in this little bitty island so you'd wake up <sighs> early awesome. 
hop on the boat, head out to the island, drop your crab traps and everything on mm. the way, work good, hard labor for the whole day, come back, grab Check your traps. crab traps, yep. you know, eat oh, fresh man. seafood, halibut in the evenings. And then, so I would go up for four weeks working and then spend a month hunting, fishing. And this is a kid. So this Dang. is my like 13 to 18 that's, or like 13 to 17 time frame. That sounds pretty good. <clears throat> it was pretty amazing, but it was all through my church and it was wow. all for the most part sponsored programs. We didn't have a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, I wasn't raised poor, but we were, I would say lower middle class. Mm -hmm. um, never went without food, never had mm -hmm. any of that. Looking back now, um, I realize, you know, where we were financially, but at the time I had everything I needed and I couldn't have been happier. And you guys go to Alaska six times exactly. and to Mexico. Like that's or just all over. I mean, I did cool. 70, 74 months mission trips i did 74 mission trips in my time in that church wow yeah and That's like amazing. i said and none of it was so much going out and like church stuff it was all hands-on it was all yeah. there's a lot of people that i had noticed in faith and religion especially in the baptist world that they would go to church on sunday check the box and then live a completely different life and for me i maybe only went to 50 church services but I was active. I was actually, I like to take it more of like the machine gun preacher route. I was a little rough around the edges. The people that I can reach are a little bit different than what you would expect to walk into yeah. church. It's still there in my heart. I just didn't like, I come in, say this one thing, but I act a certain way behind closed doors. Yeah. I've always been a wear my mind on my sleeve. What you yeah. see is what you get. Me on Instagram is exactly me in real life. Yeah. It'd and, be hard uh, to do it differently. Like, it is. Eventually, like, I may eventually cuss, I may true, smoke, yeah. I may like my weed, I may have these certain things, but at the end of the day, my heart's the same and, you know, actions speak louder than words and I've been that way my whole life. I, yeah. For me, it was more about not checking that box Sunday morning, but actually going out. It was a part of a program called Church on the Street where we would go out on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Do They would do like a 30 minute little church service and then we would work with homeless in Atlanta for another wow. four hours. Yeah. Uh, getting them fed food, make sure everybody's good on that end. So I, I did that every Tuesday and Thursday for almost five years, um, just stuff like that. So the transition into the military was easy, went, wanted to become, at first I was going to apply for the sheriff's department, found out that I couldn't carry a gun or do anything till I was 21 and I would have to work in the prison system. That's and rough. I was like, that's rough. Oh, I was like, I don't really know if I want to do that. What could yeah. I do? Went to the recruiters, got very blessed with an amazing recruit recruiter who I'm nice. still friends with to this no day, kidding. Sergeant Sinclair. So you had, you were the outlier that I got a, lucky and he yeah. took, he took, he kind of picked up on my backstory and he met my mom and kind of knew where mm. I was trying to get away from. And mm. he really set me straight, uh, huh. fought for me, got me that rip contract. Wow. Uh, I knew nothing about Ranger Battalion, didn't really know what I was getting into. Did he introduce you to sort of Ranger Battalion, like, like Rip he told, and oh, Rangers? He told me all and... about it. He explained it all because I just said I want to be a sniper. That's all. I was just like, I want to be a sniper. That's that's infantry 100%. Any way I can get on teams or anything. I didn't know a ton about the military. Uh, my grandfather was in the Air Force, but I never got to be around him that much. Mm -hmm. um, I just knew I wanted to serve and I yeah. that was the capacity I wanted to do it. Yeah. So got through basic, graduated two pounds over my 20 pounds. So I graduated oh. 22 pounds heavier. So I went over to rip around 160, okay. 165. So finished basic, airborne school, rolled straight into airborne school, finished airborne school, went to rip. Um, Did you have to keep the weight on at, uh, at uh, airborne? You, yeah, I just kept eating. Yeah. I was eating everything. And then once I finished that, I was able to get back on like a weight gain protein. Like I was drinking these shakes that were like 8,000 calories. Like looking back now, there's no way my body could even digest that yeah. much. But I was doing everything I could. But my mm. whole family's bean poles. Like everybody's tall. All my brothers are over 6'5". And my youngest brother, he's 26 now. He He's six six around like 145, 150 mm -hmm. pounds. So like we're all bean poles. Yeah. It wasn't until I did steroids fast forward a few years. Oh, wow. That was the first thing to actually break me over 200 okay. pounds and kind of change my metabolism to where I could actually gain and hold weight. No way. But yeah, went into a rip, uh, graduated rip. And then, uh, yeah, sadly my career at range battalion wasn't that long. Um, I got RFS a few months after that. Uh, What's RFS? Um, it's, uh, I can't remember the term right now. It's essentially getting kicked out of range battalion. So if you have a guy that maybe, you know, is a team leader, doesn't make it. Oh wait, what is the, 
man, I used to know the abbreviation. Any military stuff now, I'm not the best because I'm kind of a live in the page yeah. I'm in now. I'm but you go to rip, you go to rip, pass rip, go to Ranger Battalion. Yep. yep. Which one do you go to? A uh, third. So okay. I wanted to go up to Washington and mm-hmm. get away from everything because I am from Georgia mm-hmm. and got stuck right in Georgia. Yeah. So I stayed at the flagpole. And then, you know, long story short, I had a couple team leaders who were some pretty heavy hitters. They had just come back from a deployment, a uh, brand new baby private. And um, one night told me they were going to go do a little bit of drinking. Uh, told me I was going to be their DD. Roger that corporal jumped in the car, drove downtown and I was underage. So I couldn't even go to the bars, uh, sat in the car for almost six hours while they, you know, did their thing. They came back and some pretty heavy hitters that I was pretty intimidated by. And they were nice and sauced up when they came back. You know, I went to jump in the driver's seat and like, fuck off private, get in the back, Roger that hopped in the back, got on base, made it past the MPs and everything. And maybe two miles from the Brown fence, ducked the car in a ditch, couldn't get it out. MPs rolled up behind us. They both jumped out and took off into the wood line and had the child lock on. And I was stuck in the back seat of the car. So got picked up by the MPs, taken back to the flagpole. I was too terrified. I'd like to say I was hardcore from the streets, but at that time of my life, I was just too terrified to say anything and uh, essentially got RFS for not snitching. What? And uh, luckily my uh, squad leader at the time was an unbelievable dude. Uh, kind of took bat for me. My orders out of that, because they just send you needs of the army after that. So yeah. if you get RFS for uh, not meeting the standards, maybe not graduating ranger school after you're a team leader, certain things you can just go ahead and get, you know, pushed off. I got orders to Fort Polk and uh, my uh, team leader at time was like, or squad leader was like, Hey man, you know, that really sucks. There's a unit in DC called the presidential honor guard. You should go up there. You're super tall. They're going to love you. He was like, get as many schools as you can. Cause presidential honor guard likes to send guys to schools because then your uniforms look better. Ah. So he was like, go up there, get as many schools as you can and then come back. And I was like, Roger that again, not really understanding what's happening. I didn't really stand up for myself too much at that time of my life. And uh, yeah, three weeks later was in DC. And then I did almost three years in DC with the presidential honor guard. Um, first platoon was a presidential marching platoon uh, where I did 527 funerals in a year and a half in Arlington national cemetery. Oh so my. during our simples, we would have two weeks on. So you would do two weeks, five funerals a day. And that's everything from full honors down to a simple funeral where, you know, you just have a normal soldier because anyone in the military can get buried in Arlington. So some of the guys who may not have had rank or been an active duty death, uh, they could have smaller funerals, which would just be your casket team and a firing party all the way up to a full honors where you have the marching band, the uh, two full platoons, caisson, all of that. So how's did, that psychologically to do that? Like, um, it was pretty wild. Yeah. Uh, I'll be honest. the The hardest ones, the hardest ones, were Section sixty six, which were all active duty funerals. Mm-hmm. Um, Section sixty six, those were a little tougher because you got to see the families. That was two thousand six, seven, eight, roughly. So there was a lot of a lot of guys getting buried there at that time. Mm -hmm. And that's where you have the families who just lost their husband. You have all of that, where a lot of the funerals was your grandfather passed away. Mm -hmm. A little different. Um, Those kind of get a little bit numb after a while because you're just kind of rolling through it. The ceremonial composure and how serious we took it never left, but you just don't feel too much anymore. Um, The active duty ones never got easy. Uh, those were, those were always tough. So first year did that year and a half. And then I tried out for CCG, which is the continental color guard. Um, and then what's that? So continental color guard, those are the guys you see at, uh, all the main events around the U S Daytona 500 final Mm -hmm. four, um, presidential inauguration. That is the guys who carry our national colors. Mm -hmm. So your army, Navy, air force, Marine, you know, coast guard all the way down. Uh, and so I tried out for that. Everything in D.C., especially in the Presidential Honor Guard, is broken down by height. So your shortest guys are Alpha Company, and those guys are anywhere from five foot eleven to six foot. We call them the Lollipop Guild, <laughs> uh, which is hilarious to call six foot guys yeah, Lollipop yeah. Guild. Uh, my company, I was in Echo Company. Uh, the minimum for our company was six four. At the time, the minimum for my platoon was six six. So we had eighteen to twenty two guys that are six six and taller. Dang, was mine, and that was CCG, the Continental Color Guard. 
guard. And so you so, did that. So you went around yeah, all those so different I events. tried out. I failed my first rounds of tryouts. Tryouts are What's, three weeks. Yeah, what are you doing? Are you a lot of marching? Uh, no. So for Continental Colors, being in the Army, we're the ones that carry the national colors. Um, for instance, Admiral G. Bastiani, the Vice Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff, his retirement ceremony was three hours, 10 minutes long. In July, 102 degrees in Washington, D.C., we f wear full wool blues. And it is a ceremony. I am sitting there with our national colors like this. Lock knees, obviously not lock knees, but right. to the crowd. You're locked up, and I don't move for three hours. That's wild. And we're carrying the national colors, so if we pass out, then in that funeral, we had 122 fallouts. So there was 122 fallouts in that retirement, not funeral, retirement ceremony. You mean, you mean people People like just eat the ground and you have what's called simples tucked away in the wood line. So if a soldier goes down, nobody budges. Everyone stands there locked on. He eats it. Guy kind of ceremonially walks out, grabs him by his ankles, drags him off the what? field. Another guy comes out of the wood line, fills in his position in the ceremony. Ceremony continues. What? Yeah. We had what does the crowd think? Isn't the crowd like, why are these guys dropping to the crowd? <sighs> They don't care. I mean, it's what? military retirement. I don't know how many of those you've got to do, but they're pretty. I'm savage. going to one. On, I'm going to one tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> I'm flying to, to San Diego to uh, a buddy's been in the SEAL teams for 30 years. My wow. old, my old troop chief, and uh, so I'm going out there to, to for his retirement uh, tomorrow. Um, but uh, but yeah, I'm sure it may be a little different. The SEAL teams. Yeah. I mean, so maybe when the guy goes to the admiral levels, I don't think I ever went to an admiral one. I just went to. Yeah, the, the guys ones. Um, and but, for a yeah. lot of those, for a lot so. of those, um, you know, they're televised, especially when you're doing things oh. for like, especially when you're doing things for like the Daytona 500, Final Four, like the Super Bowl. Like, so you have to be perfect. Yeah. It has to be perfect. And we can't drop those colors. And yeah. that, in that one is the first time I've ever seen someone from CCG fall out. The Marine passed out during that ceremony, which, and I mean, I was borderline. I mean, it's, but... Day one of training. That's crazy. Day one of tryouts. You wake up. Uh, you do anywhere from a 10 to 15 mile run, which is an incredibly fast pace. Running is a big deal because they want everyone to look the same, be the yeah. same. Two haircuts a week. Like it's very, very uniform. Very mm -hmm. everybody's the same. So first day, 10 to 15 miles. You come back eat, you have 30 minutes, then you report to the off post room. You're wearing at the time we had dress greens, which are your green pants, white tee, ceremonial belt, ceremonial shoes. I'll walk into a room that has had heaters and humidifiers in it since the day before. Room sits around 105, 106 degrees and I stand at position of attention without passing oh. out, falling out or making any facial expressions for three hours. Oh, I would so not do well at this. You'll watch in, you'll lock up. It's called ceremonial composure. You'll it's get amazing. in your position of attention. You have all your team leaders, squad leaders, guys who've already graduated. They're constantly coming in, messing with you. Probably have about a three foot puddle around you by the end of it. My first set of tryouts, I passed out at two hours and 45 minutes. Oh my. Uh, so I had failed that one. Um, so you do your ceremony composure for three hours at about 105 degrees. Uh, after that, you go downstairs, have the medics check you, get an IV. You have an hour for lunch. Then you do an hour on, hour off, or hour on, 10 minutes off for another five hours after that. Wow. And that's day one. So start the morning with a 10 to 15 mile run and then roll into ceremonial composure after that. Because the whole point is when I was doing Admiral G. Bassiani's retirement, I knew I had already done that. Yeah. I had already right. mentally crossed time. that threshold of what my body is actually capable of, yeah. especially for us. No one, I don't know now, but at my time when I left, no one had ever dropped the army or national colors. Wow. So there was a lot of pride in that. I mean, we were the best continental, we we're the best color guard in the world. What are you thinking about when you're holding those and you're holding them like this? How are you holding yeah, them? Yeah. So for the ceremony composure, it's just a uh, position of attention, which our attention's a little bit different. Everything, your left, right face, all of that's changed because it has mm. to be done in steps. Mm. So in basic military, it's a lot of sliding where right. your feet are sliding. Boom, boom. These are all with your, these are all mm. steps. So everything's counts. One, two, click, 
one. So everything's stepwise. Wow. So you have to learn all that. That is just the attention. And then after that, we roll into staff training, which is where you actually start learning everything, working your colors. Um, yeah, so when you're actually holding the colors, you do a wrist that would be similar to this, where you crank your wrist all the way to the top. So you would have your colors directly in front. You have yeah. a, a harness that your colors drop into, and you're just staring over the top of your wrist. And no then for, uh, for instance, when we're doing the national anthem, all the colors minus the flag dips. Okay. So you're carrying our flag at the top was almost nine pounds with streamers because you have every single battle the U.S. has ever been in and battle streamers on top of it. Wish I could remember how many there are. At the time, you have to memorize all of that. You have close to 20 pages of knowledge that you have to go through and memorize, which was for me the hardest part. Yeah. Only school I failed in the military was uh, Pathfinder just because of that. Anything with memorization or having to hold like yeah. uh, book knowledge, not the greatest at really um so you have all those pages of knowledge to memorize and then you're just going over the history of the flag where the flag's flown because i'm at the end of the day you're the best at it so training's close to three weeks and then after you graduate training you're on ccg and you start doing missions oh, um and so it was a really nice it was a uh, one of the specialty platoons so in the presidential honor guard you have tomb of the unknown soldier ccg Quezon, which are essentially the cowboys who run, mm. you know, in their duty uniforms, blue jeans, t-shirt that says uh, Quezon, and okay. they're the guys, we have a full barn and stable on base because we use horses to pull the Quezon. So those guys are just the good old boy cowboys who are back there working with horses all day. No Me way. with CCG, Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, uh, Casket Bears, that's another platoon because they're on weight gain pro uh, weight gain programs and workout programs just because a presidential uh a presidential uh casket weighs so much and you have to carry it so long wow. so all those ca uh, case on bear casket barriers are just monsters so they're on a completely different program like for me uh rpt you had to have a 300 pt score to be in CCG. All our PT was on our own. So we got to pick mm -hmm. whatever PT. We didn't have to report till later in the day. Okay. And then we wore something called a blue suit, which is just a blue track suit that said CCG. And that was my uniform because our missions, we would have to work on weekends. So anybody can actually hire the Continental Color Guard. Um, they have to, it couldn't just be your birthday party. Yeah. But if you were a diplomat or you had something, a big event, uh -huh. you could hire us out. So we would be doing missions every single day, okay. sometimes two a day. Um, and then we would roll into them on the weekends too. So, yeah. and a lot of them are really awesome. I got to go to the 65th anniversary of Normandy, which uh, was probably my favorite thing I did in the military. It's pretty amazing. Besides obviously deployments. Yeah. But uh, that was amazing. I got to jump there and then- Oh, you jumped in Normandy. Mm, no and way. then got to, uh, at the time, it was the 65th anniversary, it was Obama was in. Cause I did Obama's inauguration as well. I was yeah. there for that, which was pretty amazing thing to be a part of. Mm. Um, but- all the band of brothers for the most part were still alive. I got to meet them. That's I got incredible. to walk point to Hawk with a ranger who climbed it. Amazing. Um, it was just, wow. it was a pretty amazing out of everything. I think when you went, I had actually sent you a message that it was my favorite thing I'd ever done in my military career was get yeah. to be there and walk the beaches and talk to all those guys, especially at point to Hawk. We'd be going back, but um, mm -hmm. uh, this year when my daughter's graduating from high school right then. Yeah. And, and she was torn about it. She was like, oh, what do I do? And um, so she's going to graduate. Um, so we'll do it next year. But though some of those guys won't be, won't be around yeah. next year, you know, and she knows that it was such an impactful thing for her to go do and to be standing there on the beach at Normandy with someone who was in the first wave and she's standing there with him, you know, it's just, it's an incredible experience. If anybody hasn't then they should go during that week. I mean, you go anytime, it's, it's, but and, if you go and, during that week, it's just so powerful. And the whole town comes out. Everybody's waving American flags. We went to a school, all these kids, every kid waving these American flags saying, thank you. And these are kids in like kindergarten through our, like, let's say eighth grade. Mm -hmm. And they're just all waving flags, huge smiles, all of them coming up I've and never shaking been hands better. and incredible. And you can't do it justice just by talking about it or seeing some pictures. I mean, you got to go. Did y'all go? Were y'all down for St. Mary Gleese for yeah, the big we did celebration all that stuff. when they yep. jumped? St. Mary, that was one of the greatest. We had some rain that day, but uh, it was still incredible. And we'll be going. We'll be going back. Not this summer, but the next summer we'll be there. One of my favorite stories of that: we were in St. Mary Gleese, just drinking, obviously, with all the old vets. Like they couldn't care less. Like half of them were passed out on the stage when they were doing the whole big ceremony. <laughs> but the second you put a beer in their hand, yeah. all those guys lit up. Oh, man. So 
talking to this one older gentleman who uh, had jumped in and just having an amazing conversation. He was like, you, you boys want to take a walk with me? And it was me and the Air Force color mm -hmm. guy. We were like, absolutely, sir. Kind of got away from the town, maybe walked out close to three quarters of a mile. Yeah. And he wasn't really saying much. We were just kind of walking with him. And then he walked over this area and he kind of like looked around at the ground. He was like, I'm pretty sure I landed right over there. Wow. And then just started, and we didn't say a word. And for the next hour, he just kind of, he was like, there used to be a barn and just walked us through and talked with wow. us about his experience. And I mean, I still get goosebumps. It was one of the coolest things I ever got to, yeah. got to experience and it almost reignited that patriotism inside no me. Cause I've never, never felt patriotism as I did during that week. Yeah. Same thing. Feel it over there. You feel so much more pride in America over there during that week than I have here and since I was a little kid. how everyone still was. You would mm -hmm. think that oh, it yeah. just happened. Cause it's multi-generational and yeah. it's incredible. It's, it's been passed down and somehow actors like it, everybody's dressed in the uniforms and it's uh i mean 101st airborne flags yep. 82nd airborne flags everywhere uh u.s flags everywhere obviously um man it's a powerful time to be there every yep. american should see that i think they'd come back with a little a little more appreciation for uh for what we have over here you know but uh that's man wild but you no tattoos at the time no nothing well i did but everything was hidden hidden yeah, yeah everything yeah. was tucked away so finish out my time there and the one thing that had rubbed me a little bit of the wrong way is I, I was seeing like squad leaders, E7s, E8s, E9s that had never deployed. Yeah. They were what we would call an old guard baby. Guys mm. who had come in and just stayed their whole career there. And for me, uh, I was pretty upset about not being able to get over. So mm -hmm. once my reenlistment was coming up, I was like, who is the first unit deployed? I don't care who it is. Do they I try to, to keep you? Because they've cut all this training into you and you're so good at doing all your those things. It seems like it's be tough I to train somebody. Say, I will say at the time, and again, I'm still a goofball. I'm trying really hard. I really want to fit in. I had some guys that really took a love for me, but I would say 50-50 if you talk to guys I served mm -hmm. with now, quite a few would be pretty surprised to see the guy I am now. Really? It was just, I, I, I just tried too hard. Mm -hmm. I just really wanted to fit in and just be one of the guys, mm -hmm. which can sometimes when you're trying that hard kind of rub off mm -hmm. to not go the right direction. Mm -hmm. um, and I would say just about anything, like they'd be like, let's see, man, you know, I was out snowboarding. Oh, dude, I, I was a huge snowboarder growing Growing up, like just mm. wanted to be a part of the conversation. So I would say it was about 50 50. I had a lot of guys that were really pumped for me to go. And then a lot of that just, dude, you'll never, you'll die. You'll, you're not going to make it. You don't want to go overseas, like really? that kind of thing. And I just knew I had to do it. So first, well, before unit, I ask you about that, how, what were you thinking about when you're holding this flag for three and a half hours in July and a uniform and people are falling out all over the place? What are you? Pride, yeah. honestly. Um, I took a lot of pride in it. I've always taken, if I do something, I try to do it to the best of my ability. Um, I took a lot of pride in my uniform. I took a lot of pride in how I looked. I took a lot of pride in, in my job. And it seems like a meditation you're almost doing there. Three and a half hours 100%. standing there. Like, what are you, what are you thinking is your, are you trying to keep your mind blank? Are you putting it as a song in your head? Uh, are you I'm staring at, at something? People, I'm you... uh, one of the tricks I used to do is I would tuck a Jolly Rancher in my in my cheek and a jolly ranch would normally last me like an hour and a half to two hours because you would try if i didn't move it around or uh -huh. like suck on it which obviously you can't do because my face needs right. to be locked it'll just slowly dissolve over time so that's where you're counting ta your time yeah so that was one especially on funerals i would always mm. pop a jolly rancher in right before and it would just be something for me to focus on yeah like just to kind of have and i would okay. feel it get smaller and smaller and once it got smaller i kind of tuck it under my lip uh -huh. and just kind of feel it go back and forth just okay. little things to kind of have something. And then, you know, if like there this has been an hour someone, and a half or whatever. And you're like, okay, at least you're not like, has it been 30 minutes, 45, an hour, an hour and a half. Uh, but that giving you a way to keep track of time. Yeah. And to a fault, I can get in my own head. It's mm. easy for me to, I can just sit and I can get lost yeah. in here and just let things out. That's one of the reasons like archery, blacksmithing, which we'll get into yeah. certain things that can quiet all that. Hmm. There's not many things in my life that can focus my brain to one thing, okay. which is when I find that kind of thing, I go all in because my brain's, there's a lot going on 24 yeah. seven. So moments of silence or meditation or anything like that, it was easy for me to have stuff to kind of yeah. think about or 
I, I don't really know how to explain that. It's just I was always okay with it. Okay. Um, and then just like looking at the crowd, little things like that, the sky, just anything to kind of just keep your mind focused, moving your toes back and forth, adjusting your knees. There's little tricks, especially yeah. like you're so focused and it's so painful after a while. Your focus is kind of on like giving yourself little bits of relief mm. without anyone knowing what you're doing. Right. Um, I mean, just something as easy as going from the palm, like the the front padding of my foot to rolling back to my heel yeah. to put my weight on would be like the biggest amount of, or locking one knee and then shifting my knee out so that my other knee held my weight mm -hmm. to give my left leg, you know, a little bit of a break. Jeez. There's a lot going on that, people wouldn't know. They'd say, oh, this dude's just standing here. Yeah. But there's a lot going on with my body, just trying to do very light adjustments to make sure that I'm completely locked. I mean, you don't want to have a uh, drink an allergy of water before you do something no, like that. Nothing. Yeah. You Which can't. sucks during the summertime when you're actually doing that kind of stuff, uh -huh. but you're sweating so much. I mean, our, our blues are wool. Yeah. So everything, like we completely gut them out. We have to press all our own stuff. We have full press shops and all of our barracks, like industrial presses. Jeez. So, I mean, just my uniform cleanup every weekend would be almost two hours, two and a half, three hours for me to get my uniforms back up. Wow. Where if you're talking to a tomb soldier, tomb guard is 24 to 36 hours for them to get their uniforms perfect. Amazing. Uh, my roommate was a tomb guard, Kyle Browski, badge number 555. Wow. Uh, I watched him go through his entire sentinel training. And that's just, I have more respect for tomb guards than a lot of people. There's, there's a lot that goes into that. And I got to watch him go through all his training and it was pretty wild. Yeah. Well, Mike Glover was doing that. He was, yep, uh, he was the out there thing. too. Yep. Man, that's uh yeah, that's a lot of, that's some discipline right there. But uh, when it comes time to leave, how, how are you searching for that, uh, that unit that's going down range? Like, how are you figuring I out? I literally go? said, who's the closest one deploying? And, and did, they, did they know? And they did. Yeah. Third ID had just deployed. Mm. So left there, went back to Benning back to Georgia, which I was excited about because I didn't know where my career was going to go at this time. And I yeah. was still trying to get back to battalion. So I was like, perfect. It's in Benning. I'm back in that area. They're already deployed. Mm -hmm. uh, left uh, presidential honor guard, went back to uh, Benning and uh, yeah, joined up with third ID and then three weeks later deployed for Iraq. No kidding. What do you do th during those three weeks? You getting any sort of a, a uh, yeah. So or? we did, we did train up. I can't remember what the abbreviations are. We had to do some kind of training where I believe we went to Savannah for a few weeks. Um, my brain's pretty bad when it comes to stuff like that. What did uh, they give you? Are you like, Hey, you're big. Here's a saw. Like, what did they give you? Uh, uh, I was just a normal rifleman, a dismount rifleman at the time. Really? So they gave you an M4, not yep. uh, some M4, sort of an automatic nothing. weapon. I got, uh, I got on the SDM once I got out there. What's that? Uh, I believe I used the proper, it was just essentially uh M16. It was our DDM. Sorry. The DDM. So got a DDM, the designated okay. rifleman. So I got one of those once I got out there and then very luckily became friends with the sniper section we had finished out that deployment and then when where'd I you guys go back, uh iraq we were down in uh uh mabula iraq down to joff province oh, okay so uh down there for that finished out that deployment came home what went, was that deployment like uh nothing too crazy it was a pretty decent deployment what are you guys doing what's your mission uh mission was a lot of train overwatch uh train denial um driving around with a lot of shakes a lot of meetings um, few little things popped off here and there, but nothing like too intense. Really? So no um, IDs? No, we did. Yeah. Still IDs, few gunfights here and there, but it wasn't like crazy, crazy. Um, and again, like I'm really weird talking about military stuff. Cause I just have this mentality of like, no one's harder than us than vets. And I'm always terrified if I mess up one date or get one thing wrong, yeah. you know, the woodwork comes out and it's well, like, yeah, we'll keep, we'll keep it broad, broad strokes, broad <laughs> and strokes. And I so always get so nervous. I'm gonna mess a date up or get <laughs> one thing wrong. Or yeah, get this and then people are going to come out of the woodworks. Like, I know it's, uh, I'm, it's I'm rough. So blessed. Like the military, like it was such an amazing chapter of my life, but I'm, I'm very blessed to not have to be a high school quarterback. Yeah. Like I was able to make a career and do things outside of the military that was completely different than what I did. Yeah. And I'm blessed to have one of those brains that my head is just a box of drawers. And once I'm done with something, it closes it and I open up that next drawer and that's the next chapter. So well, when it comes to like little yeah. things like that, I always struggle on. I couldn't even tell you like, I know our fob was fob echo. Um, I couldn't tell you road signs. I talked to guys and they're like, yeah, man, you go down. Remember where that you know that coffee stand was and then there was that bazaar i'm like man i got no idea it's just <laughs> i my i've always been that and yeah. I've, I've learned through my life and 
about 10 years of therapy, there is a little bit of trauma in there and stuff mm. where my brain has been trained just from past and childhood stuff and mm. a lot of other things. It's easy for things to kind of get put into a box. Okay. So uh, I'll just completely miss whole months and years yeah. of my life and still kind of figuring that out and working on that. This last few years has been the biggest year of growth for me mentally, kind of like the person you get to see in front of you now is not at all who I was in the military. Interesting. Um, it was a completely different person. How long was that? How long? Did you guys, are, was it a year for you guys? Yeah, exactly okay. a year. So it was like just over like 12 and a half months. Um, came back, went to uh, join on the sniper teams, got shifted over to sniper teams while we were over there. Oh, really? So um, what, what were you doing then without having gone to a For then it school? was still training. I had to go out with my platoon and uh -huh. do all the normal stuff. But when we were back, I got to go over, hang out with all the sniper section, start getting geared up for sniper school when we get okay. back. Because I wasn't with them then, I didn't get to go out on any missions with them or anything like uh -huh. that. Um, so got geared up, came back, did the official transfer over to snipers, and then went to a sniper school. And which one do you go to? Because the uh, army has a few. Yep, I went okay. to the actual schoolhouse, the okay. real sniper school. <laughs> <laughs> gotcha. Uh, went to uh, the actual schoolhouse week three. I failed target detection. What's target uh, detection? Target detection is where you line up on the line. Uh, you have an entire grid set up. So, and again, be careful. Be nice to me. Believe you had ten to ten items set up in the wood line. You have your far points left and right boundaries. Mm -hmm. You have to find 10 items, describe what they are, what grid they are. Is that item okay. working? Is yeah. it not working? What is the item? Draw the item and not what the full item is. If I can only see the barrel of the rifle, right. I draw the barrel of the rifle. Um, can I say that it's working? I don't know that because- Appears to be. It. I think that's uh, Exactly. Yeah. So you have all your paperwork, you lie there. I can't remember the times. Let's say it was 25 minutes, you're lying on the left boundary 25 minutes you're on the right boundary mm. then let's say you get 15 minutes to move so i can pick up my binos or spotting scope move to a different angle lie down and go back to scanning my sketch okay. scanning my sector so essentially it's just training your eye to find those things just like no straight lines in the wild nothing's completely mm. black in the wild like those little things right. to kind of get your eye on nailed found all of my items but my last item i was off a grid square so i didn't report the proper grid square and i got dropped for that Ugh. which i found out is exactly what happened to randy shugart oh, really? which was one of the biggest reliefs for me um at the time we had a lot of civilians sniper school had i believe five civilians that had been there 20 30 plus years so like who, the continuity oh it was amazing and they could tell how upset i was mm -hmm. i was pretty devastated not in an anger like fuck this kind of way but just like kind of a shutdown, yeah. I failed. And I'm a hard learner. Almost everything I ever did in the military, I had to do twice. Um, so finish that. Luckily, the instructors were so amazing that they let me stay. So instead of a five-week sniper school, I did 10 straight weeks. Oh, wow. I'm what we like to call a so Bravo So did, did you roll into the next one? So you... I got to stay. I got to do all events. Okay. I was still in class. I still had my sniper buddy, still spotted for people. I got to do all the events except graded events. So whenever they went into a graded shoot, yeah. a graded stalk, a graded anything, I had to sit with the instructors to the side. Okay. So wow. the benefit to that is stalks is what gets everywhere. So class yeah. one started with 42, graduated eight. Okay. Um, stocks wow. is what eliminates the majority of yeah. people in sniper school. So, uh, did that and I passed all four of my stocks in that first one. Um, found out that stocks was something I was really, really good at. Nice. I was great at stacking trees, which, uh, was dead space. Funny work dead space. Exactly. My final shot in that first round was at close to, I think it was 170 meters and I didn't even have my top on. I was standing up on a tripod and just had eight trees stacked. And, uh, the way I had my trees stacked, they weren't able to walk any of the walkers on me. Nice. Um, so that class graduated, I want to say that Saturday. And then I rolled into class number two that Monday. So I went home for a day and then rolled right in. And then yeah, how was it going through the second time? Right through, nice. which was amazing because um, I had, I didn't get to try out for a uh, top shot or top spotter or anything um, just because it wasn't part of the quite world, fair. Yeah. Uh, just because I'd gone through it, right. you know, 
directly before. Yeah. Um, instructors were a little bit harder on me the second go round, which was kind of amazing. Uh, sniper school is supposed to be a bit of a gentleman's school because mm. a lot of those guys were literally rolling into their deployment on teams oh, wow. the next week. So it wasn't so much about the smoking and the hard side of it. It was about getting that knowledge so mm -hmm. that you can go over and perform what we're supposed to right. do overseas. And uh, sadly, a lot of those guys didn't really take that seriously. So at the end of that, school when you do the little write a review to come yeah. back a lot of guys wrote a pretty heavy review and it was all guys that got dropped which mm -hmm. was kind of wild how that works but they called the school a joke said there was no physical training blah 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 mm -hmm. so rolling into the next class we had one of our ncos uh sergeant rodemacher he was trying out for rrd which is the Ra uh, ranger recon division mm -hmm. um he was trying out for that so he was in the middle of all his training broke the brakes off everybody oh. i mean we started first day and i came from a gentleman's class the first one yeah rolled into the second class with the first different. day was a 20 mile ruck march oh and uh yeah. so they were a little hot That's after those reviews so bit of a different change up we yeah. only had a week of really them breaking us off and then rolled into more gentlemen after that okay. but uh yeah it was probably my favorite part of the military training wise because i just loved it i loved everything about yeah. it i loved the stocks was very blessed to blow right through that we graduated with six in that class Dude, so that's started pretty with wild. 44 graduated six of us that's amazing Are you use the same rifle the whole time uh yeah we were shooting with the 110 saz and the m24 those were our two primary rifles. what's the what's the saz uh the saz i couldn't tell you i only know the 110 i couldn't break down what, what is it though picture. uh semi-automatic uh okay. seven rounds and a mag Okay. Um, and then the M24, obviously, bolt-fed rifle. Got it. And then one week with the Barrett at the end of school. Oh, at the school. end, okay. Yep, so, and you do Barrett, uh, which is shooting tanks way out in the middle of nowhere. Nice. Which was pretty fun, but I enjoyed the SAS more, and that's what I ended up carrying. So, like, um, uh, like an SR25 or uh, Mark uh, 11? I believe so, that sounds about right. Like and again, like, that's another one of those things. Where I know, little, I know. My little brother probably <laughs> knows more about guns than I do yeah. from playing Call of Duty. Yeah, it was yes, not bad. I had one thing that I knew how to use and nice. was pretty decent with that. And, you know, I never got into reloading or super deep down the rabbit hole when it mm -hmm. comes to guns. You know, most guys in our community, once they get out, mm -hmm. they really keep that G'd up. Sadly, I haven't even shot long range in almost eight years now. Yeah, yeah. So I found blacksmithing and, you know, really devoted myself to that and put a lot of that stuff to right. the side. Right. <clears throat> well, do you but, go right back then? Where do you go then as a sniper? Now you so, have this designation as a sniper and do you go through a full workup and then deploy or what do you do yeah, next? Yeah, so then after that, that was year wise. I'm almost wanting to say around, let's say I graduated sniper school in 2012. So things were starting to slow down a little bit. Mm. Uh, third ID was getting geared back up okay. and this time they went to Kuwait. Okay. Um, it was just a staging for Kuwait. Nothing happened. I was there for maybe four months. And then didn't really enjoy that too much. Tried to go back to battalion, but at the time they wouldn't bring in anyone in. Um, and I was at the rank I was at then because I was a corporal. They didn't have any openings. So I was like, well, shoot, I can't try back out for rip. Uh, was married at the time. And uh, my wife was really pushing me to get out. So went to the guard after that for okay. two years. After Kuwait, come back from Kuwait. Yep, came back from Kuwait. Did you do anything in Kuwait or you just on base kind of on standby nothing, for something? Nothing, yeah. straight standby. And then after that came back and then went to a LURS unit in Georgia. What's that? Which, uh, long range surveillance. Okay. So it was uh, actually for a National Guard unit. It was one of the most high speed units okay. that they got to be a part of. I mean, in my platoon, uh, we only had two guys that weren't tabbed or scrolled. Mm. Um, got on sniper teams with the LURS unit, went straight over there, uh, went to Africa for four months, okay. went to uh, Cameroon out there. Oh, wow. Um, was in Cameroon. We were training with the Burundi tribe and a few of the other tribes on Pathfinder operations. No kidding. Because they were in a bit of a civil war at the time. So uh, we were down there with them. Okay. Um, are you training up there, snipers, or what are you yeah, doing? Yeah, doing uh, sniper stuff, going mm -hmm. over um, target detection. All our pathfinders are going into pathfinder operations because they had triple canopy out there. Mm -hmm. So they were doing full drop, sling loads, everything hitting in, recovery, all of that. And then I was doing more of the sniper stuff and target detection and stuff on that end. Oh, geez. How long are you there? Uh, almost four months. Okay. Um, absolutely loved it. Africa was one of the most humbling things I'd ever done in my life. Uh, never met happier, kinder, nicer people. Um, 
it was it was a it was a really enjoyable time getting to see yeah. a completely different culture and uh, getting to train and learn a lot from those guys. Uh, and it was my last airborne jump. I got to jump into you jumped Cameroon. in Africa. Yep, nice. Got to jump into Africa. That was my last jump, which was pretty wild and not a good one either. They were doing mass exit. It was everything was mass, and Just I mean we static had, line out the back. Yep, and we were jumping. Door. We were jumping their planes, their instructors. Oh wow, our shoots. Very no lucky. kidding. Side but, door? What are you doing? What kind of play? Yeah, yeah. All side. Yeah. We did one ramp blast uh, in the beginning, and then my last jump was side. Mass exodus. And we had almost, un- I mean, over 15, under 20 burn throughs. Like, there was a lot of issues on that jump, and I was the last chalk to jump and almost didn't do it. Just because we were jumping us, them, us, them, us, them. And the guys you're jumping with, their training wasn't quite the best. And there was a lot of guys getting their air stolen from them where guys were just burning through their canopies. Uh-huh. We had like three guys break their legs. One guy knocked completely unconscious. Like we had some pretty heavy hits, but uh-huh. second I jumped, he ate that as hard as I could and just tried to get uh, away from everyone I could. I just, geez. I hadn't got to do, I hadn't got to jump, you know, with anybody else before. So there was no wow. way I was missing jumping into Africa. That's pretty cool. For my last jump. Yeah. And then uh, after that, came back, um, did another maybe six months with the guard. Okay. And then at that point, I was struggling balancing civilian life and military life. Mm. I am a all-in person to a fault mm. and uh, was just really struggling with the lack of respect. Respect, even in this unit, which was unbelievable. And sadly, all LERS units are disbanded now. Mm. So there's no more long range surveillance units. Okay. But uh, even with this unit, just the lack of respect in the guys who weren't fully committed to what mm. we were doing, you know, they work this job and have a completely normal life, <clears throat> and then come in and play Army, you know, for a couple weeks mm-hmm. and then roll back. That was tough. And I just decided at my eight year mark, it was time to jump into the civilian sector. Nice. What did you, uh, you, you want to do? Were you still thinking about sheriff department, police department? Or? I had no idea. Yeah, so police department was 100% the goal. Um, all my tattoos at the time stopped exactly at my sleeve. Okay. Uh, was incredibly devoted and dedicated to that. Trained my ass off. Um, left the military. Uh, went to Cobb County Police Department, which is one of Atlanta's highest paid police departments. Mm-hmm. Biggest budget. SWAT team is unbelievable. They have a crazy good sniper section with them. Um, one of the best SWAT teams in Atlanta. So I knew I wanted to be with them, but it was a very difficult precinct to get into. They mm-hmm. only honestly took the best. Their rules were a lot strict. I could have walked onto Atlanta the day I got out and got mm-hmm. hired, but I really wanted to be with Cobb just because of how elite their guys were. Um, went, did their PT test. Uh, after that, got out, did PT test with them, set the second fastest time they had ever had on their course. So right out the gate, I was setting myself up very well, super respectful, super mm-hmm. punctual was still in the LERS at the time. Mm -hmm. So still had that military bearing. Um, My uh, detective was super excited about it, uh, pushing me really hard. Uh, Normally just the workup takes about six months. I was already at the polygraph and interview part within a month. So they were fast tracking me through that. Went to do the polygraph, sat down, passed the polygraph, no problem. Went to do my psyche valve, did the you know, three hours of filling out Hmm. the million questions where one out of 20, they throw that one little question in. Have you ever, you know, felt bad? You ever want to kill yourself? Hmm. Like, cause with military, they're super afraid of PTSD and everything. Hmm. Filled all that out, passed that part. And then you go into your interview with the psychiatrist. Hmm. Things were going really smooth in the beginning. And then she was like, well, have you ever had to take anyone's life? And I was like, yes, ma'am, I have. And she was like, how did you handle that? I was like, well, I've been, and just like I'm talking to you, Uh, I was very blessed to be able uh, to handle that as well as I did. I have an amazing support system back home. I'm a man of faith. My faith was able to help me. I realized that it was me or them. I realized that, you know, it was my job to do this, to protect someone else and save someone else's life. And I'm very blessed that I was able to handle it as uh, well as I think I could. Oh, excellent. Excellent. Couple questions. So let's, let's go back to that. How did you really feel when you had to do that? Well, like I told you before, uh, I was completely fine with everything and you know, was very blessed to be able to handle it. Okay, cool, cool. Couple more questions. So, so let's go back to that. It seems like you handled that pretty well. How did it, did you ever really, have you ever been in any fights or had aggression after? And I was like, well, ma'am, I'm a, I run security in a nightclub in Atlanta. I'm a bodyguard. You know, I, I get in tossed. So, so you fight a lot. 
Well, no, I, I don't fight a lot. I just, I work security at a bar. Like, it's my job. Do you to, know this is going south here? Or are you sure, just like, oh, she's really interested. 100%. And I'm not trying to get irritated. Yeah. I'm very, it takes a lot for me to get riled up. And I was like, oh, yes, man. She goes, oh, so you get, could you tell me about one of these fights? And I was like, well, sure. You know, this client punched this person. I was able to get behind them and carry them out to our police officers. And they were able to do it. Okay, okay. Are there any more? Have you seen Roadhouse? Do you want me to tell you every fight I've been in? Oh yeah, unless that's too many. Have you you're you're in so you've been in so many fights you can't even tell me mm. how many? And I was like, no, ma'am. I, I'm not saying that, but my job is literally to get into fights and break break them up. I'm not hurting people. I'm trying to use the least amount of force I can to fix the situation. She's okay, like, okay, so let's denied. Is that She's the like, big okay, stamp? So let, <laughs> goes back and and then finally she just got almost irritated it was like all right well this pretty much wraps up what were the three things i asked you to remember at the beginning tree couch bird because they tell you three things to kind of remember mm. just to show your cognitive okay. you know memory in the beginning they're like here's three words i want you to remember and at the end of the interview they ask you what those were nail those and i'm two weeks away from going to the academy so I've already got all my police uniforms. I've got everything. And my detective called me a week out and was like, hey, brother, you failed your psyche valve. What oh, happened? Yeah. And I was like, what are you talking about, man? And the worst part is I had gone in with a buddy of mine who was uh, in previous in Ranger Battalion. He walked in, put his packet down. Guy looked at it. He goes, oh, you're Ranger? He said, yes, sir. He goes, hell yeah, Rangers lead the way. Have a good day. He was out of his interview in five minutes. Oh. And I was with her for an hour and 15 minutes. Oh. So told him about everything. And it turns out she ended up getting fired uh, four months later for family military. So I don't know if maybe she had an ex-husband or what had happened, but she definitely had it out for military guys and mm. because of that i wasn't able to try out for cop county again oh, for man. two years oh. so it put a pretty bad taste in my yeah. mouth because it was something that i really wanted to do and i was really motivated to do that and then once that happened it just you mm. couldn't pay me to be a cop um maybe not the right answer but it definitely worked out for me in the long run mm. um but i was pretty upset about that started working bar security um at this really small bar in atlanta for like 60 bucks an hour and then fast forward three years later uh you did that for three years yeah well no i was a bodyguard in bounce for quite some time in between that and atlanta but we hit a pretty rough patch financially and i went and contracted okay. so i went and contracted i did triple canopy and then transferred over to sock after that how many uh deployments uh, two rotations, rotations with that embassy details just sitting yeah. on top of embassies Where'd nothing you go? iraq again uh based out of kuwait i lived in kuwait in the populace for a year and then would just jump on my contract back and forth no kidding. because my first contract with triple canopy i didn't know the difference between dod and dos so i applied for every contract company i could find that all my buddies were telling me to of course the dod one hit me back instantly okay I was like dude we can get you over here in two weeks this is amazing i'm gonna go contract got into kuwait and realized it's one of those little kuwait guards in the little brown suit getting paid you know 15 bucks an hour to sit on a gate very quickly was not cool with that me and three other guys there was a marine recon guy and a ranger that were with uh the three of us we were like he didn't sign up for this luckily again triple canopy was pretty awesome sent us back we went through whips in north carolina What's went that? down whips is like the training program that uh you go through to do department of state okay um did that at moyok and then after that did one rotation uh in iraq on the embassies with them and then how was yeah. that uh it was really good i really enjoyed it super chill it was nice to be around that mindset around nice to be around those guys again i was really struggling a lot with losing that community and mm -hmm. that brotherhood and having a purpose mm -hmm. i don't do well with not having a purpose yeah um if i don't have like a mission or something to work towards i can get in my head pretty quickly and it just doesn't do well for yeah. me. Do you um, convoy stuff? What are we doing over there? Do what? Do you do convoy stuff over there? No, it was literally just sitting on U.S. embassies. Okay. Yep, just sitting on the roof of a U.S. embassy, making sure everything was great, doing 12-hour rotations. With a rifle or what yep, do you got? Yep, yeah. with a sniper rifle. Same thing. Actually, I had another M24. So same thing, super nothing crazy over there doing any of that. And then, uh, yeah, the at this time, I am was married in the Army went through a horrific normal military divorce, uh, ended up marrying my best friend at the time and that whole sob story. Now I'm dating my wife now. Uh, 
was realizing very quickly that being overseas and all that just wasn't boding well for our relationship mm -hmm. and really wanted to try well on this one. So after that one ended, came home, quit contracting, and two weeks later we were pregnant. No way. Found out that we were going to have mm -hmm. our youngest daughter. At this time, um, I'm full-time bodyguarding. Uh, I was very blessed to move up very quickly in the Atlanta nightlife. Uh, was running all the VIP security at the number one nightclub in Atlanta. Um, Thanks, you were like Roadhouse. Yeah, yeah. I mean, not, not Roadhouse, I don't want to say Roadhouse. Higher, it's uh, not, yeah, it's just I got really, really heavy into the nightlife in Atlanta, bodyguarding, doing security. Um, did bodyguarding for a lot of our NFL players down there, a few mm -hmm. other people, you know, that I did on concert and tours with, and uh, really devoted myself to that kind of life again. No, felt good. that purpose, was very blessed to be good at it. I took it very seriously. Okay. Um, finished up contracting, was still doing that, but uh, I knew, I knew one. I was going to be a dad, I wanted to go ahead and start putting that life aside because I already started feeling different. Mm. Um, I always feel like I've been good at what I've done in my life because it's not that I'm okay with dying. I've just never really feared it. Mm. I've always been in a very good place mentally where I'm good with where I'm at and I'm happy with what I'm doing. And if something ever happened, I'm okay with it, which made me do my job very mm. smoothly. But once I found out that I was having a daughter, that started changing. Mm. I started having a little bit of, ah, do I really want to put myself in this situation? Do I really need, I started second guessing a little bit and I was pretty in tune to myself in that, especially for the clients I was working with at the time yeah. I needed to be a hundred percent focused and I wanted to be there for it. Losing my dad at 13, I didn't have that father figure when I needed it the most. And obviously, Obviously it wasn't his fault, but I, I, I didn't have that. And I knew that was the thing that was the most important mm. to me because I was very blessed. My dad was an amazing father and he made time for us and we camped nonstop, which is where the overlanding comes from. Mm. And he was present and losing him. Those memories are really what got me through a lot of really hard times in my yeah. life because he took the time to not sit in front of the TV and watch football or do that. It was yeah. focusing on his kids. So when he was present, my father was very present yeah. and I knew that's the kind of man that I wanted to be and the kind of father I wanted to be. And I knew that those two worlds <clears throat> weren't going to cross over very well together. Yeah. Um, what, was the, what was the most, uh, when you look back at that time in Atlanta and you're doing the, the bodyguarding and, and that sort of thing, what was the, are there any memories that stand out as like the sketchiest time? Or was oh, a hundred percent, a hundred percent. Um, been shot at, had people come back with guns. Um, like one of, one of the, one of the, one of the <laughs> sketchiest that instantly comes to mind was we were at our nightclub. We had a big VIP table. There was a lot of, a lot of big people spending a lot of money. Now we're talking like, a good night on a table, they could drop twenty five, thirty thousand dollars mm -hmm. Bottles, jewelry, whole nine yards. Have a client, a fight breaks out in front of our table, and it was with a very large human, very big guy, some pretty heavy street ties. And a uh, fight breaks out. He was on top of one of our other security guards. I was very blessed to be so tall and lanky and I'm really good at rear naked chokes. That was kind of one of my go-tos because yeah. a lot of times when somebody passes out or you choke somebody out, a lot of times when you bring them back, they don't even remember what happened. There's a lot of confusion. It's just, it was easier yeah. and I knew how to safely do it. So this guy's on top of one of our security guys, got on his back, was able to get my hooks in, choked him out really well, went out, dragged him outside in front of our nightclub, did a sternum rub, brought him back. And he was completely, didn't really know what was going on. I was like, hey brother, you need to leave. Our police were there. I was like, officers, you got him now. And the problem was when he came out, it was everyone outside the club that was like, man, you got knocked the fuck out. Like right. they were all just like making it way worse right. by talking shit. And then he started getting aggressive again after that. Cops have him. They actually let him go, which was kind of the problem. And then that night, I was very situational awareness, situationally aware. I'm very blessed for. When I went to leave our nightclub, our doors lock behind us mm -hmm. once it goes. And I would always do the thing where I would open it up, kind of tuck my foot in, Look step around. out, kind of just take a couple little looks here, left, right vehicle down at the end was parked the second that door opened and i started walking out that car i heard it ignition come started coming up and i just saw all the windows start dropping down and it had five guys in there with mac 10s that were coming to do the drive-by and luckily i still had my foot in the door they sped up really quickly and i just was able to tuck back in get back in and i just dropped to the ground luckily they never fired any shots uh. um 
our police officer, they had everything on camera that we had our cop on, on deck. They went and never found the vehicle. Couldn't find them anywhere. It took off. So I had about a month of having to worry about that. Yeah. And, uh, Working in Atlanta, working for some of the clients that I worked for, I also had some pretty heavy ties with certain organizations within the city. And this gentleman was with a different organization, that a street gang that didn't align with some of the people that I had been working for. Mm -hmm. So uh, it was a pretty sketchy month of just constantly checking over my shoulder, looking over my back, all that. And then actually a month later, the gentleman, because they had a police report on the guy that I had choked out, who was the one that had started all this. A month later, he actually killed himself. He was right a crotch rocket in Atlanta doing about 190 and hit a semi. So that was probably one of the sketchiest ones where I yeah. really had to watch my back, check everything. And it had just, I had worked in the city for so long and for so many different kinds of people that it was getting to a place where it just wasn't the best. My wife hated going out with me yeah. because I was constantly working. Right. Um, one of my buddies had been killed the week prior. He was just sitting with his wife at another nightclub relaxing and uh, somebody he had gotten in an altercation with came up behind him and cracked his head open with a, a champagne bottle and uh, split his skull wide open and he died. And that was just off a fight. So it just got to where Oof. the ego was so I could have destroyed this guy on the ground and mm -hmm. chose to be respectful, get him outside, make sure he was good and all that. But just because the egos yeah. get involved, there's no more just a fight. No good deed, as they say. There isn't. What's um? What are the what were the gun laws like in uh, Georgia slash Atlanta specifically? Did you carry? When oh, you're going oh, out hundred percent. Yeah, I never. Even to this day, I, I never don't have a firearm. Yeah. Um, yeah. All of our, our, we have same thing as out here, constitutional carry. At the time, we were still uh, uh, concealed carry. Mm -hmm. But when I was bodyguarding anything, I always had a vest on, always had a pistol, always had all that. I was always armed security. I had my blue card in Atlanta for being able to carry as a bodyguard. Okay. So I went through all the training for that. And so in the city so, of Atlanta, you have to have something extra to carry? Um, it depends. For me, for the clients I was working or for, I wanted to protect something. myself as much as possible. Um, and I took it more from a, I was very blessed. And at this time, I was a big boy. I was about 345 pounds. 345? Yeah. So I know we're jumping around a lot. My life's Dang. pretty crazy, man. There's been a lot of crazy. You stayed on that weight gain program from boot camp. Yeah. Well, I got on steroids. So oh. yeah, once I got out, I was barely breaking 200 pounds and uh, went and talked to my doctor and they were like, you're metabolism's just too fast. No one in your family, I was the first male in my family to break 200 pounds. And they're like, we actually would recommend you getting on, you know, steroids. So I did test and trend for almost two and a half years. Yeah. Went from 200 pounds up to 340 was my biggest. Three and that was my peak 40. bodyguarding. Yeah. Dang. Did you guys have SOPs uh, like in the club as far as like you go, you take somebody down rear naked choke. Do you have other guys that come in then and make so sure no one's going to come up is and completely throw a, you know, uh, you know, just because you're on the ground, you're dealing with one person and you know, two, three, four of his friends come over and all of a sudden you're getting stabbed. So we were, so when it comes to the club, um, that was a completely different because our staff was so amazing. Yeah. Um, the club, nobody was getting in with firearms. There was no real threats of that. When I was working in the club, I was only dealing with VIP security. Yeah. So when we would have celebrities or anyone come in, get a table, I was the one that would deal with their bodyguards, walk out, talk to them, get them into the building, stand at their table, make sure if anything was needed, right. any of that, I was the one that would liaison all of that. A lot of times, once the evening was done and the clo club closed, I would then start freelancing, join in with their team, then leave. So when it came to the club, we very rarely had any issues. Well, like that guy you took to the ground and- or, or, and Yeah, for that, joke, that like, was once a month. Yeah. Like once a month, we would actually have to put hands on people because, and this is gonna sound silly because you've been teasing me about it, the roadhouse rules. We took that very seriously in a sense of be calm, be nice. If you knew how many be times- Be nice until it's time to not be and, nice. And I took more pride in being able to talk a situation down mm -hmm. than when you walk up and you're like, what's going on here? That's automatically already starting it's Already this escalating. Off. But if I could talk to you and you and be like, hey guys, Listen, understand there's some beef here. I don't really know what's going on. How about this? You go over there, tell them Luke sent you. They're going to hook you up with the free round of drinks. Let me take you over here. You are free. Let's just have a good night. You guys are out here to hang out and have fun, right? Anytime we could talk and de-escalate a situation, even down to physical altercations, just getting them separated to where we can talk and not have to do that. And the guy who ran all our security at the nightclub, Uli, was one of the best at doing that and handpicked all his guys to include myself very strategically. And we rarely had any issues.
Now working at some of the smaller bars and stuff, very different. Really? But working in this nightclub where I finished out my security time those last two years on top of bodyguarding was incredibly well run. And Did we you enjoy very it? Very rarely, oh, I loved it. I loved it, but again, very different life. Why'd you like it? Um, I loved the pace. I loved the, I loved the purpose. I mm. loved having my brain have to focus on something, reading mm. situations, watching that massive football player come in that I know in about four hours, he might be hard to handle walking over, introducing myself. What's up, brother? You're a big motherfucker. You know, how are you doing tonight? If you have any issues tonight, you don't, you come find me. Mm. I'll take care of everything. Let me get your first round. Mm. That kind of like reading those situations, paying attention, just keeping my mind focused on what was going on at all times. I loved that. And again, just protecting people, like being there so that people can have a good time mm. and not have to deal with the stuff that I see or have to deal with the things that could possibly escalate to something incredibly serious, yeah. getting to stop those, which is I'm very blessed. What made me a great bodyguard. I wasn't there to catch bullets. I was there to get my client out of the situation before that situation even happened. Yeah. So if I see something going on, I need my client, which is I was very blessed to be able to handpick mine and choose who I worked for to where if I go, hey, Devontae, let's go. I shouldn't have to say anything else. He puts his hand on my belt loop. He grabs my belt. I put my arm around him. We're out of there. No questions asked. As I'm loading him in his car, gunshots go off. That's my goal is to get my clients out. And I was blessed to have the size that a lot of these guys want for physical appearance, mm -hmm. especially rappers. They want that 400 pound, six foot nine guy that looks great. Yay, you have security, but what's that really mm -hmm. gonna help you if it really comes down to it? He'll take bullets for you, but I'm not willing to die. I would if I had to, but that's not, I'm not just here to catch bullets. I'm not looking for street cred. I just wanna get my guy out of there and was lucky to have the size as well. I yeah. mean, if you look at A-list celebrity bodyguards, a lot of them look like Evan Hafer. Mm -hmm. They're just your small, unopposing guys who are so good at reading that situation that they get their clients out before it actually comes to having to pull a gun, shooting someone, stabbing someone, getting in a fight or taking a bullet. Are you, bo just, are you boxing or wrestling or uh, doing jujitsu or going to the range with anybody? Uh, range, yeah. Range, shooting, all of that. Uh, when it came to uh, actual training like MMA training or anything like that not a drop i don't know why i yeah. <laughs> looking back well, now talk about at it 375 like, or whatever after 40 it may have been, but i just i've been in so many physical altercations my whole life i've just always been confident with my ability yeah. um the only time i wasn't when i actually went against like a real wrestler somebody rushed a stage of an artist i was working with and uh when i went to grab him he instantly went for double leg underhooks yeah and luckily i knew how to sprawl uh -huh. sprawled out because i did combatives in the army i went okay. through level four combatives that's not a bad program yeah so it was pretty solid so i had a little bit of a base yeah. but i definitely didn't keep up with it once i made it to the level where they started like our little competitions were no more starting from the knees jujitsu style right. it was like closed fist to the face realize i don't like getting punched too much yeah and uh, i'm just not i don't have that mentality of like i didn't take joy in it Did you like, carry like a sap in your back pocket or anything like that um or is that like no At go. the time, I didn't. I didn't. No. I never really needed anything like that. And like I said, for the most part, I was able to get out. I only had to pull my pistol a couple times and all of it. Never had to pull the trigger because, again, I was very good at reading the situation because the other issue is... If you pull that pistol and you go to shoot, now I have to deal with this homies. I have to deal with all the backlash. If he is affiliated, now I have a whole gang after me. So there's just a lot of steps. And not to mention the legal system. What... Uh when you did that, did you uh, just show it that you had one or did you actually oh, no, it was draw full down? Draw. Yeah, I like... punched out three times in my career mm -hmm. where it was full and thank God all of those I didn't I didn't need to. And uh, why? Because they were armed or because they were going to for uh, something or because they had knives or bats or what's... Uh, two of them, one of them was they were armed and they were just showing it and I knew for a fact he didn't have ammo in his pistol. What? How do you know yeah, that? Because I knew his homie that he was with that he had just got it the night before and he didn't even have ammo yet. Uh, another guy wow. was a knife and then So he took one. out a pistol with no ammo in it. No, it didn't even have the mag in the bottom. Oh my yeah. goodness. And when he lifted his shirt, I was able to see that he didn't have a mag and he didn't draw. If he had drawn, I would have pulled the pistol. I would have, I would have pulled the trigger. He just but showed it. He had just lifted it up and went to put his hand on it. And by the time he put his hand on it, I was already in full draw. Wow. But okay. yeah, no. And it's just, there's twice that I could have, and police told me I was completely legally able to pull the trigger. I just, 
I don't want to take a life unless I have to. Mm-hmm. And again, both of those, if I had, we would have had to leave the city within about two months yeah. just because I, my, I, my family would have been in danger or I would have been in danger. Yeah. And so it just, it wasn't a line of work that I was interested in staying with, you know, once I was a father. Yeah. So use my GI bill school or nice. use my GI bill. And I went to welding school. Okay. And actually in welding school is one of the times I had to pull my pistol. <laughs> so really? That was, yeah. So it was, it was a student actually. So it wasn't even associated with your time as a, as a bodyguard. No, not bouncer. even, which is, I just have bad luck, man. My wife, if she was here, she could tell you stories for days. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen to me. Okay. She, Austin could attest to that. He's been a close friend of mine for quite some time now. It's just, I have some pretty weird luck. Luckily okay. I always get out. Okay. But man, if there's something weird, that's going to happen. It's going to happen, happen around, around you. Me. Oh, man. But I uh, decided I wanted to do a trade. Um, yeah. I loved welding. It was another one of those hyper-focus activities that I really enjoyed. Okay. So I uh, went to welding school. While I was in welding school, I found a little article in a newspaper. It's $125 to go to a school called Goat and Hammer in Atlanta mm. and to take a railroad spike and forge a knife out of it. Nice. And uh, my wife was like, oh, you should do that. That looks fun. You've talked about blacksmithing before. I had known what it was, but didn't quite really grasp what blacksmithing was. And uh, she really pushed me. I wasn't in a good mental space at that time. I was really struggling. When I I left the National Guard, I had 32 jobs in a year and a half. Um, I couldn't find anything that I wanted to do. And I worked for literally every security company in Atlanta and quit all of them within about three weeks Uh just because of the caliber of the people I was working with irritated me pretty heavily. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's when I was blessed to fall into freelancing is was able to just work with myself and a client. Okay. But went and took that road spike class. And uh, to this day, it's one of the happiest I ever was. I was at complete peace when I was doing it. Everything in my life went away. A hundred percent focus went into what I was doing. And I called, I was almost emotional when I called my wife when I left, just because I was so overly excited. I was like, this is the greatest thing I've ever done. I feel so amazing. And just because of my reply, and we are broke. We have no money at this time. And, um, I was just telling her, I was like, babe, I don't, I just, I love this so much. She was like, you need to keep doing this. She was like, this is the happiest I've ever seen you. Oh, that's awesome. So I bought their cheapest classes they had, which was like bracelets and bottle openers and a little like how to make that that. like this. Exactly. Exactly. Did you make me a railroad tie knife? Cause I have like two of them. I don't Um, think I did. I don't think think so either. The first thing you got was the bag opener. Yeah. Yeah, right there. Um, but because uh, is that a way that a lot of people start? Is with the railroad ties? Oh, yeah. like a- it's oh, it's the best way because railroad ties aren't high carbon steel; they're mild steel, mm. so you can quench them in water. Okay, not the greatest thing to make a knife out of because it is not high carbon steel, so it's not going to retain that edge. But to practice forging on, it's amazing because okay. you can't mess it up. You can forge on a mild steel at a much colder temperature, so it's a great thing to practice on. To where if you forge on high carbon steel at a lower temperature yeah. you're going to get stress fractures you're going to get d lambs you're oh, going to wow. get cold shuts okay so you're going to get a lot of issues in that steel yeah this is the, this is my first one right here yep then. okay yeah this thing's awesome i love actually this. is there another first I one think the revenant was first right is that is that is yeah this, is that right here that. yep Boom. i think the revenant was, that was the first? first i think that was the and that was my first revenant ever uh, that is are my, you serious that was my number one bestseller knife awesome it is the staple of my business is the knife you and i designed together Damn. are you kidding me yep dude and that's not tooting your horn either. It's just, I knew I wanted to do something special when you and I became friends and started talking. I knew I wanted to design a blade that kind of fit the savagery that is Jack Carr. And uh, I always loved that clip point uh, mm-hmm. style blade. I wanted to make mine. And already, I mean, since that one, it's had maybe seven uh, evolutions okay. of that blade since to where now it's pretty honed in. But uh, yeah, oh, that man. was the first one ever. No and, way. Uh, decided on the Look at revenant. that. Look at the thumb fits right there. I, mean, I know. It's, it's, I used to feel the new feels one. feels good. That one's like almost three years, almost four years old. Now. Yeah, probably. Yeah. But it feels so good. Like that right, just fits perfect right there. Man, that's awesome. Yeah, you know, that's amazing. I love yeah. it. And who's doing your leather at the time? Or that who? was me. You did this. Yep. I did. I don't even do leather now. So that's man. another way to date the blade. Yep, Dang. that was all me. I was doing all leather on them. That's amazing. How did you learn how to do that? Uh, YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> yep, almost no everything. Way. Almost everything besides my classes is YouTube. No so, way. So uh, luckily, I was able to build an amazing relationship with the master blacksmith Mark Hopper and uh, his apprentice Jess, who's now—I mean, I wouldn't even call—I'd call her a partner. She's an 
unbelievable blacksmith, but they were just running this great school and just introducing traditional blacksmiths to students. And uh, they took a liking to me, stopped charging me classes and uh, I would just go and help. And, you know, they just, Mark essentially became at the time one of the closest father figures I had and uh, just really took a liking to me. He's one of the most interesting humans alive. Dude Mm -hmm. wears a kilt, just completely out of this world, (laughs) but is one of the most talented blacksmiths walking. Blacksmith in Africa, for oh, multiple wow. years his wife is from a tribe in africa oh. like just a very interesting interesting no kid and uh yeah so started making stuff with them mark wouldn't even let me really make knives for the first few months he said i needed to learn how to make the tools to make knives ah. so i made my tongs made oh, that's my hammers cool. Like started actually blacksmithing. Yeah. Um, that's why I call myself a blacksmith, not a bladesmith. Ah. Um, just because like my first love was blacksmithing. No kidding. And then started making knives for, you know, a couple family members, then yeah. a couple friends. And then, you know, and the, the thing I was so lucky with is while I was in welding school, I was night school. Okay. So I was home with my newborn daughter while my wife worked during the day. She would get home at five. I would leave by 545 to get to school by six. And then I was at school from six to about 11, 30, 12 at night. So during the day I had all this free time Mm. and I was getting paid to go to school because the GI bill. So the bills were kind of covered for a month because Atlanta has a very good pay up for your payout. So I was getting close to three grand a month to live on top of them covering all my schools and getting book allowances. Wow. So it put us. Is that the new GI bill? Uh, I can't remember. This would have been five years ago. So, I think so. yeah, probably maybe yeah. 17, 18. I think that's the new jab bill. And uh, so it was great. And it gave me the time to kind of play with this during the day because my daughter would have nap time. She was really good at just, I would put her in her little playpen in the driveway and just kind of <laughs> fiddle around in the shop. And then towards the end of welding school, I was selling enough knives, maybe five to 10 a month. Did you put a website up or what'd you do? A website wasn't even after. Like I was just like, babe, I think I can make knives. I'm going to hold off on getting a welding job and try this out. So we built a website about six months after that. Okay. Weren't doing really good. Did you, um, was it Grizzly Forge at this point? It was Grizzly Forge. Oh yeah, it was Grizzly Forge from day one. And where did that come from? Um, so the Grizzly Forge, I just couldn't, I couldn't find a name at all. And I've been obsessed with bears my entire life. Back yeah. to the bear hunting. Yeah, yeah. First animal I ever killed was a black bear. Um, I've been obsessed with bears. I love, I've always wanted to live out west. Mm-hmm. Out west has been held a very special place place in my heart for Mm. so long my dad when he proposed to my mom he was out here working in wyoming okay and being in atlanta we could see maybe one star which was Mm. the north star because we had so much pollution and i would lie out in the yard with my dad and he would take his finger and he would hold it up to his sky and he would say luke one day i'm gonna take you somewhere where you can do this and there's gonna be a thousand stars Mm. in here Mm. and uh The West just always held this wild place in my heart. And grizzly bears, bears, my mom, my whole room, like with my brothers, like my side of the wall was all bear stuff. And it's Mm. just, for some reason, bears have always been a big part of my life. Okay. And uh, I've killed a grizzly. I've killed just about every breed of bear you can except Mm. a polar bear. And uh, I've just been obsessed with bears. It just felt Mm. like the right fit, which was kind of funny calling it Grizzly Forge while I lived in Atlanta. Right. Um, But I just knew that's where I had to get one day was where wherever there's a grizzly bear, Bear is where I want to be. Did it's you have your own that. anvil at this point, or what are you? What are you using? So else? I'm using a railroad tie. I bought a whole bunch of fire brick, drilled out two holes, shoved some little butane torches in there that would take me close to 25 minutes to heat a blade up. To where now I can heat a blade up in about two and a half minutes. Yeah, your setup now is pretty. So sweet. I'm just sitting there, just running it, banging it with a two pound sledge from Home Depot on a railroad tie. Wow, was my that's first awesome. Setup. Do you still have that railroad rail tie and everything? Yep, I still have all of it. So my first anvil, my first mm. forge, everything but the fire break okay so i still use the same hammer i have a few new ones now but uh yeah i have all my original stuff and uh so we took that leap of faith on the business got the website set up and uh what year was, is this this is it would have been maybe four years ago okay four or five years ago roughly and um I was doing custom orders mostly at this time. I'm not doing drops yet. So doing, so the website's not up yet. I'm only doing customs and uh, two months behind on the mortgage power gets shut off. Water gets shut off. Have at this point, my second baby is born because I have almost Irish twins. My daughters are a little over 14 months apart and um, I'm failing. 
I'm failing as a husband. Um, I'm not in a great place mentally. Uh, uh, I'm failing with the business. I'm not being able to provide for my family. And uh, was one of the lowest parts. I went downstairs. What? I photographed my entire shop to sell. I had got a welding job. Um, was already had, was set up for my interviews for my welding job. And my wife said, babe, we are so far behind already. She goes, what's two more weeks? Wait to sell your stuff. Just, just go two more weeks. We mm. literally can't get more behind. So ride it out. So one week goes by, and then I get a phone call from Evan Hafer. No way. And, How do you uh, find out about you? Uh, so uh, obviously Matt, everybody knew who Matt was in the military just from all his YouTube videos and everything. Um, started, man, we're, there's a lot here. I'm just talking about yeah, myself. Yeah. Like, So this story goes back to... Black Rifle, I start following Matt. At the end of one of Matt's videos, this little bitty short guy comes up and starts talking about coffee. And he's like, hi, I have a coffee company. Come buy coffee. I think he only made 75 bags. And I, everything Matt was doing at the time, I was a supporter. I was like, this dude's so fucking rad, super cool. You know, coffee, I'm gonna buy it. I bought the first bag Black Rifle ever roasted. What? And uh, so that happened. Black Rifle starts. I start seeing everybody else, Rocco, Jared, all these people throughout Matt's videos. Black Rifle starts taking up. But at the same time, they started a subgroup called Drinking Bros. Mm. Started Drinking Bros. It was at the time Matt, Rocco, and Evan. Um, I can't remember the other dude's name that was on it. But... Um, they were all on this podcast and what it was originally is it created a community of vets that could talk and be there for each other. Mm -hmm. And going back to feeling alone, it very quickly, I joined the subgroup when it was maybe 1500 people. And what it's does that mean? Hundreds, a what does that mean? It's like, a, it was a little group on Facebook oh, okay. where it just called drinking bros and oh. you jumped in and it was just, a, a group on Facebook where okay. everyone was talking, you were getting to know everybody. Hmm. It was a really close knit community to the point of when I moved, I put something on there. I was like, Hey guys, I'm in Ackworth. Cause within drinking bros, there's subgroups by state. Huh. So there's Georgia drinking bros, you know, Texas drinking bros. And it's just taking a whole bunch of vets, putting them together so that you're not alone anymore okay. is what it originally started out as. So it instantly gave you com a community. So when I moved, I put on that subgroup. I was like, Hey guys, I'm moving moving to this house. Anybody wants to come help. I'm going to have beer and pizza. 40 people showed up to my house. No way. Out of this group. So they had created this unbelievable community based around a podcast. Well, I loved it. They were talking about like vet stuff, crude humor, like all the stuff that I missed from the military. Mm -hmm. Um, at this time in my life, I'm bodyguarding for a client who was just a big, big, big money guy, wall street, all of this, I'm gonna make this story very short. Um, essentially, he did the exact same thing Bernie Madoff did. I was mm. with this client for six months, every single day, getting paid the most ridiculous money I'd ever got paid, traveling all over the US with him. We were in Nashville, Tennessee, pulling up to our Airbnb. We got surrounded by 45 federal FBI, uh, local SWAT team, and sheriffs. Did a full call out, surrounded the vehicle, MP5 at my head by the FBI female, dogs, helicopters, whole nine yards. And what was crazy and impressive is I didn't see it coming a mile away. Wow. We pulled up to our Airbnb. I hopped out of the vehicle, was walking up to the door to check in. And my client rolled his window down. And he goes, get in the car, get in the car, get in the car. And we're in a million dollar neighborhood in Nashville, Tennessee, yeah. where the road leading in just had a whole bunch of cars parked on the road. Uh. So nothing out of the norm. And I run to the Suburban, jump in, because I'm driving up on the Suburban at this time. Yeah which was mine and uh, jump in the vehicle, throw it and drive. And he's lying. Cause you don't know the what the threat is. You don't know what, no idea what's happening. Jump in the vehicle. He's just going, go, 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 go jump in, throw it and drive, start going. And five of the cars on the high in the Pull road, in? road just go. Oh and then man. All the ones behind us. Dang. And I mean, within seconds, we are completely U shape in the front of us. Everything's clear behind rifles drawn out wow. at about eight dots on me at this time i'm vested i have a pistol on me rifle behind me pistol Dang. in my door because we were traveling on average with like 200 300 dollars with us like in cash in cash and um do what how come he was just a baller 
He just, I mean, we went to Vegas and spent $2.5 million in four days. Huh. Just, I mean, I mean, every kind of show, every kind of, just a different kind of lifestyle. Yeah. If you don't live in that, like, A-list kind of lifestyle, right. it just makes no sense. Man, well, those federal agents, you, you think, where they, like, all that everyone is lying down as you pass in those cars? And then as soon as it would have, I mean, there, there's the only Boom. thing I can think of. And I was pretty relaxed at this time. We were just on a little vacation. We had mm -hmm. three people was in the car. We were going to hang out in Nashville for a few days. And, uh, they when, that, doing, when MP5 went to your head, were you like peripheral vision? Is that finger on the trigger? Is this thing on, is this this person's first I honestly, day? I honestly don't remember. Yeah. It happened so fast and so loud. Like I had never been on the other end of yeah. what we do. Wow. So it was wild violence of action works 100 percent. dang they've so i'm just sitting there and i realized well i realized that it wasn't this wasn't gangbangers or something yeah. this is because they all had fbi across they had 10 can't remember the exact number like 10 to 13 agents that flew from um san francisco to make the arrest oh interesting so they had i might know one of those people okay everybody was had all their stuff visible so yeah. i knew we were good my hands instantly went to yeah. the roof they start doing call outs so called him out first, uh, back passenger, exit the vehicle, back driver, exit the vehicle, passenger, exit the vehicle, and now it's just me. Yeah. And which, if you know the highest threat, leave in. That way, if you have to start firing, you're not hitting uh. everybody else. So I'm just chilling in this vehicle, and they're like, all right, sir. And I was like, uh, I don't know. And now this is the first time I talk, and I'm like, um, who's in charge? And girl next to me, shut the fuck up. Really? Like, right like, I'm like, oh. and then one of the other guys is like, sir, this is officer Smith. Yeah. Uh, what is it? And I was like, sir, my name is Lucas O'Hara. I'm ex military. I have a pistol on my side, a pistol on my door, a rifle behind me. I'm wearing a vest. I have no idea what's going on. I'll do exactly what you tell me to do. He goes, thank you so much. Because they have the door this. open? What do they have? No, are they, nothing. So my door's still closed. My hands are still on How are they roof. hearing you? Is like back doors open Windows are open. Windows are open. Because we had all our windows open regardless. So I'm talking to them through my open window. Because we were just hanging out, music on the radio, like that kind of day. So standing there, hands on the roof. And she goes, he's like, is your pistol in your door panel? And I was like, yes, sir. He goes, all right, what we're going to have you do, she's going to crawl over your center dashboard, you're going to get on the ground, not dashboard, uh, center console, yeah. you're going to get on the ground, you're going to let my officers detain you. And I was like, yes, sir, absolutely. Right. He goes, go ahead and start moving. And I went, yeah. So <laughs> like about as slow as I could go. Be, he yeah. he kind of chuckled a little bit, which very quickly released the tension a little. Yeah. He's like, you move a little faster than that, son. And I was like, thank you, sir. So I moved out, got the ground, jumped on top of me. Why didn't they rough. come over and pull and open the door and just... Because the pistol was in the door. Because I told them I had a pistol. I had a pistol mounted to my door. So if you open the door of my Suburban, I had a holster mounted to the side of my door. So yeah. if my door opened, I could grab my pistol off the door. Yeah. So they, I don't know why, but they didn't want me to come out my door because of that. They would rather me keep my hands visible, crawl across, get on the ground. Yeah. So get on the ground, very quickly detain me. Um, once I was in handcuffs, the whole mood changed. Mm. Everybody kind of took a breath, took me down to the curb. At this point, straight shaking. Leg shaking, hand shaking, adrenaline dump is yeah. finally, you get that little clear spot. Sit down, they go through my wallet, find my blue card, carries permit, military ID, my service dog ID, just all my mm. stuff. FBI agent comes over, they go, do you have any idea what's going on here today? I don't, I don't have a fucking clue what just happened. Because he's already gone. Backed oh, wow. him in a car, gone. Dang. So I'm sitting there and they're like, all right. And everyone, like the cops come over and they're like, what's up, brother? How you doing? He goes, where'd you serve? Start talking about military mm -hmm. stuff. All of them were ex-vets. Got me out of handcuffs in about five minutes. And they're like, you have no idea what's going on. And I was like, no, I don't. And they're like, your client has stolen millions and millions of dollars. Wow. And they're like, we've been setting this up for almost six months now, which is the exact amount of time I had been working with them. Dang. His previous bodyguard had no background, which I picked up the client from mm -hmm. him. I had known him in Atlanta. So when I got picked up, I am apparently because of my background, it was a big red flag to him because they were putting this whole package together to swoop him. Mm. So all of that, the guy comes over and he goes, all of this is for you. Wow. And he was like, we thought we were going to have a firefight today. Jeez. And it was just this, like, everybody's laughing now. Two of the guys came over and gave me a hug. And they're like, you, you did good, buddy. You did good. And he was like, we thought this was going to go because we couldn't figure out why he had someone yeah. like you working for him if he didn't know this was about to happen. 
Jeez. So, Did they have yeah. air overhead? Did you see a, a helo or anything? Did you notice oh, yeah. That? So, yep, we had a helo and everything. Just one? Just one. Uh, just one and then a news. There was a news one that showed up pretty quick. Mm. Um, and then two dogs and then the rest was local SWAT, the FBI, and then the... There was a few guys from DEA Man. there because I don't know why the DEA was there. There was at least two a that joint. I can remember. Yeah. Um, so stuff. did they know, do you ever find out if they were tracking your vehicle or if they know oh, everything they had photos of me at the nightclubs? I were yeah. like, they had everything. Cause as soon as that happened, I went home and went to directly to the FBI headquarters in Atlanta. I put money through my account for him. I did everything. Oh, wow. Him. Half his car. So now you're my a name. conspirator. And here's the other issue is three weeks before that I invested $75,000 with him. Oh wow. Of money that I didn't have. Did you ever get it back or you didn't have it? No, I, I took out loans for it. Oh geez. So was that a gone? I bought, I bought. So the way that works is you invest, let's put it in first is you invest. Cause he was doing hedge funds. So he did it identical to what Bernie did. So, which I didn't, no, at the time, and this was mm. someone that I considered like a father figure. I was with this man. He was older. Mm. He was in his fifties. Um, I was with him all the time. Like I watched him work. I watched him trade. I watched everything. He was a true sociopath, like nothing like to the Jeez. point where I was holding my hands on the money, handing it over to him. Cause I wanted to start my own security company. Mm. And I was like, this is literally everything I have. And I go, I hope you don't, you realize how much I'm trusting you. He put his hands on top of my hands and he said, I cannot tell you how proud I am of you. Cannot wait to see where your business goes. I love you like a son. And he wow. took that money knowing by this time from what I found out later, he was already on the run. He knew this was going to happen. And after six months of being with him every day, still did that. So the vehicle was in my name. He covered all the payments on it, which was through the roof because I had an up armored suburban. So roughly $200,000 vehicle. And then all that money I took out in loans because I had perfect credit. I had 800 plus credit score. Took all the loans to invest this. You invest, let's say $50,000. On the first of every month, you get a return of 2,500. So my goal was, let's say invest 50,000, get that return of 2,500, put all that money back into it. Fast forward five years. Now I'm making a profit of this money, invest another. So then within X amount of time, I'm just getting 50 grand off the inch or five grand a month off the interest of the money that I put in. Yeah. Makes sense. I had seen people make millions off it working with him. Mm. Like there, he had clients that were just making money hands over fist. They were at the top, and of the closer to the top of the pyramid. And I trusted him. Mm -hmm. And there was no reason for me not to. He was working with some of the biggest names in Atlanta. Like I had people that I had worked for previously that were investing with him. Mm -hmm. And I waited six months before I did it. And then finally hit that part. And that was three weeks away. So I lost everything. Mm -hmm. I lost my client. I'm now stuck with, I can't even come close to covering all this. They take the vehicle for... Oh, they repoed the vehicle yeah. within two months because I couldn't cover payments on it. I couldn't oh, cover I mean, I was wondering anything. if the FBI took it as part of their case or whatever. Couldn't cover. Doing. No, they left the vehicle. So after all that, they leave with him. The three of us are sitting in this million-dollar neighborhood, all our shit everywhere, all the doors open, all my guns lined up neatly on the floorboard of my car. They left you with the pistols, and, uh, Oh, they left me with everything. I wa We all walked away, no problem. And so FBI left after about 30 minutes and they got our statements. Then we were just with local PD. So they, but they, they left like, your pistols right there, but they, they clear and safe them? What do they do? Oh yeah, clear and safe them. Everything's just yeah. lined up on the floorboard of my knife, everything, because I had a lot of weapons. Everything's just lined up neatly there. And uh, the local PD is just like, well, guys, sorry about that. I uh, hope you all have a good day. Wow. And they leave. And that's and it. So it's just the three of us, me not knowing what the hell just happened. Everything, my whole world just got flipped upside down. I was just in one of the most intense moments. Yeah. Stateside that I had ever been in. Jeez. And uh, so go straight to the FBI, walked in, was like, my name is Luke O'Hara. I don't really know who to talk to. Uh, I just was held at gunpoint by a lot of your agents out of San Francisco. I feel like I need to talk to somebody about my client. I'm there to on somebody a day in my life. Fuck that dude. Like when you do that and you steal and take my money, I was like, I don't even want to be affiliated with I'm this. surprised they didn't tell you something there. Like at least give you a card. Yeah, and, so uh, the, guy, to the to guy who took it, he talked to me for about an hour, but he was just the walk-in agent. He was actually in charge of children's sex crimes. Mm -hmm. So he wasn't even a white collar crime. But maybe a week later, white collar agent got a hold of me. They're like, yeah, man, you're completely clear. We can tell just of how you did all this, mm -hmm. that you weren't involved. Your name's completely good. If we need anything else from you, we'll let you know. That was it. 
What happened to that so guy? So after that is when that dark moment set in because mm. now I've lost everything and um, <clears throat> didn't know who to turn to. So I reached out to the Drinking Bros group. I reached out to Matt, Evan, Rocco, and Jared and wrote a three paragraph letter. Never had any communication with them at this point. And I uh, was just like, hey guys, I don't know really who to turn to. I'm in a really dark place right now. I just lost everything. Um, I don't even know why, honestly, I sent the message. I just, I didn't have anyone to talk to. Um, within five minutes, Jared, JT, reached mm. out to me. He was like, what's your phone number? Shot him my phone number. He goes, where do you live? And I was like, I'm in Woodstock, Georgia at the time. And he goes, all right, I'll call you back, hang up. And I'm like, oh man, like, I don't know what's happening. Did I upset him? Like, I've never talked to these guys or a little <laughs> bit of a celebrity in my mind at this time. And um, he calls me right back and he goes, hey man, our t-shirt company, Art15, we are a uh, warehouse that we use is out of Woodstock. It's called Terminus. I have a job for you. They're going to start paying you as soon as you walk in. Just get over there. No way. So nice I'm a JT. loyal, I'm a loyal person to a fault like to a fault, if someone does something for me, that never goes away. And uh, that is what put that foundation for my love no, for Black okay. Rifle and these people is once they did that, mm -hmm. I would have killed for them. Mm -hmm. It's just, just because of like my pack background, how I was raised, like those street ties run deep for me. And it's like, I'm, I'm loyal and it, it, that, that meant a lot. So walked in, got that job, started folding t-shirts the next day just to kind of offset it. Mm -hmm. But I was looking at, six to seven grand on the first of every month I would have to owe on everything that I had running, yeah. which rolls into contracting. So got that contract to try to offset it. I was like, I've got to make money fast. How do I do that? Contracting. Okay. So, cause that was my last big, big client bodyguarding was after what that. happened to your Bernie Madoff. He's in prison. Yep. Got arrested got locked up. I haven't looked into the case recently. Last time I looked at it yeah. was maybe two years ago. Um, but yeah, to my knowledge, he's locked up for a good 10 at minimum, but it's white collar. So apparently he had already done it. Everything, his name, everything I knew about him was a lie. Whoa. Yep. Every single thing. Like he was in, and it was really cool of the agent. The agent could tell I was pretty upset about it. It was really affecting me that I didn't see this coming because I'm pretty good at reading people and I take a lot of pride in that. And it was my job at the time uh -huh. and uh, completely blindsided me. And that agent sat down with me and he was just like, hey man, I want you to know, like you can't, I could tell you this is beating you up a little bit. He was like, this guy's a sociopath. You mm -hmm. realize he would have passed a polygraph on everything. Mm -hmm. Like people like this are true sociopaths. He's, like, He's done this four other times, been locked up, got better at it and still gets let out. That is crazy. That's how white collar goes. Like a lot of these guys just get turned and burned unless they do something so crazy or so yeah. big that they're locked up like Bernie where they're yeah. locked up for a really long time. Wow. So that reached out to them and uh, that started the relationship with those guys. So I only worked at Terminus for three weeks and then left for my contract. Uh, War, listened to Drinking Bros, supported Drinking Bros, Black Rifle Coffee the whole time I was contracting, making coffee for everybody every morning on my base. Like not everyone really knew what Black Rifle was yet, mm -hmm. but it was starting to really gain steam. Um, Knew I wanted to be a part of it, but didn't know how. Mm. Started studying videography, but all the guys they had were already so good at it. Uh, started, I applied for a couple of the other little positions they had. Never got them. And I just mm. kept telling myself, I kept telling my wife, I was like, one day I'll find a way to bring value to these guys mm. and do something. Um, went on the Drinking Bros cruise. They did this big cruise where all of them went out on a cruise, got to meet everyone, started building real relationships. No where was the cruise? Uh, we went to Mexico. It was like maybe three, four years ago now. No Can't kidding. remember the exact date. It was one of the last big things they did with that. No kidding. So right before we linked up kind of? Yeah, no, exactly. So huh. maybe six months before that. Yeah. Um, Cause I think you probably started seeing my stuff cause it was after the bag opener. Okay. Um, so linked up with them, met them, started building those real relationships. And then people within the company, Baker Levitt was the first person to buy one of my knives. And then Lacey saw Baker's knife. She bought one. So-and-so saw Lacey's knife. No and way. then my knife started circling, yeah. circulating throughout the company. And then now we're back to just photographed my entire shop about to you know, sell it yeah. all. And I get a phone call from Evan and he goes, Hey man, uh, I want to create a bag opener. And I'm like, okay, talk to me. And he goes, well, our bags, like I want something that can like, we could do specially that you can open a coffee bag. Could you come up with something? Yes, sir. I had five prototypes in 45 minutes. Yeah. Well, this one right here. That's this <laughs> yep. one. 
So right. this I thing say, is sharp, man. And this is an early one because it didn't come with a sheath. Oh, that's a, or that's the first yeah. round. So that's a, yeah. Well, y'all actually, you're one of the first 10. Oh, wow. So I made 10 special ones with people's names. Standing yeah, that's what, right there. And uh, yeah, you're mm -hmm. one of the first 10 ever. No way. This thing's so sharp. One of like, I mean, it's like, yeah, this has no problem opening back. If you back. only knew how much that destroyed me. Right. Because at the time I had only made, I had not made more than maybe five knives in a month. Yeah. So Evan picks the design he likes. He goes, perfect. I want 250. <laughs> I'm in my garage by myself, never made more than five knives at a time. And I said, not a problem. I can do that. That's the no right worries. answer. That's the right uh, answer. Three weeks of pro some of the most excruciating pain I've ever been in. How come? And I knocked it out because I wasn't used to work. I wasn't used to that. Mm. My hands were completely raw. Mm. Like I have a photo, if you go way back on my Instagram, of just blood soaked bandages for me forging because I forged all those out. I didn't know how to cut them out yet. There's a lot of tricks you can do now when you're mass producing something, mm. which I learned on the second run <laughs> to make things a lot better. So yeah. I finished those out, sent them. Man. That turned the power back on, turned the lights on, got everything going. Black Rifle started sharing my stuff with that. So shipped that off. Evan goes, dude, these are amazing. I love them. I want another 300. Okay. So this time I brought in help. My mentors did all the sharpening on them. Oh, so wow. then I created a line to yeah, do this. this. sharp. Did those. This thing's crazy sharp. Did those 300s, business is crushing now. I have orders out the butt. I'm backed up like 80 knife orders. Here we go. This is great. I go to the post office to mail all those off. Uh, I go to the post office to mail them. Went to a buddy's house to help him move a thousand pound gun safe. And that's the thousand pound gun safe that I dropped on myself and broke my back. So the day that I shipped those off and I'm about to start making knives and take my business For off. For anyone listening, don't move your gun safe by yourself. We moved it with four people. No. All okay. my size. Don't move it by anyone who's not a professional. Never. Yeah. It's Never. well worth whatever you it costs. You could not pay me $100,000 yeah. to yeah. move a gun safe. No. Yeah. Like that one over there. Guess what? Someone's coming in here that knows what they're doing, that does that for a living. So we were loading up a thousand pound gun safe onto a trailer. Everything was smooth. I'm about 300 pounds at the time. Uh, I'm the guy on the cart. We have a guy left, guy right, guy on the back. We're loading it up on the ramp. Dude. I'm pulling it like so. And the gentleman on the back, instead of pushing from the base of the oh. safe, he Just, pushed from the top, and I went from 100 pounds of resistance to 1,000. Um, if you've got your trailer here and your ramp here, my back landed on dude. that ramp. So it snapped my back over the ramp, and the safe landed on top of me, and I fractured my spine in six places. Oh, And I uh, woke up in the hospital. Uh, my whole stomach was black and blue. They thought I had ruptured. Uh, my entire intestines. I woke up with them because I have uh, O negative blood. So I woke up with them trying to figure out where to get my blood from because they thought I had ruptured my entire gut. Turned out oh. I didn't. Again, best case of scenario happened in the worst case scenario. Um, I walked away with six broken, uh, I fractured my spine in six places and my ankle had a hairline fracture. Oh. So all things considered, Dude. I walked away great, but it's week two of COVID. Oh. My wife and I at the time, my wife now, she and I weren't married yet. We had just separated. I had just moved into a brand new house because I was a bit of a piece of shit at the time. I was in a brand new house, week two of COVID, by myself with a broken back. And yeah. um, my nobody wanted to help. Nobody would come over. Everyone thought we were going to die. Like it was uh. the height of the pandemic where we're, why? Because one of our daughters has asthma. We're like wiping cereal bags off because you just you didn't, didn't know, know what yeah. was happening. There was that little bit of time of fear before... Mm. We kind of started figuring things out. Ugh. And uh, my wife, who hated my guts at the time, was uh, the woman she is to this day and why I'm the better version of myself for her. Uh, she still came, brought the daughters, is the one that helped me. My next door neighbor would come over once a day to help me use the bathroom because I couldn't walk. And uh, I was left alone in my own head for three and a half months on my couch. Um, that's when I started using marijuana. Um, the VA gave me 65 oxys, 45 Percocets and 65 muscle relaxers. And because it was week two of COVID, they were like, we don't want you to have to come back. And they gave me everything. Um, wow. when I got home to the house, I should have sold them looking back. But, uh, right when I got back to the house, I had my best friend take them and he flushed all of them. Oh, wow. And uh, I self-medicated with THC and edibles for almost that whole time. I was doing close to 1,000 milligrams of uh, edibles a day, which is a pretty, pretty heavy dose, but I was in so much pain um, that I needed to find a way without 
I knew if I started on pills, I wasn't going to come out of it. Mm-hmm. So uh, I didn't have much experience with THC at the time. And uh, yeah, it changed my life. Uh, when I came out of that, I was the man you get to see today. Uh, there's been a few other insane. hiccups since then, but uh, it changed my life. Breaking my back was the best thing that ever happened to me. It put a lot of it in perspective. It uh-huh. forced me to stay still and stay at home forced me to be in my head and forced me to start looking inside and see what kind of man I wanted to be. Man. But for anyone listening, watching, maybe, maybe don't break your back in order to get there. Maybe. Yeah. Maybe don't, way. But maybe. back to me <laughs> learning the hard way, sadly, yeah. it's the kind of things that I need in my life. I don't learn from the easy that lessons. Is crazy. Man. I don't know. So, so many, I've heard so many different stories about people moving safes. Um, I think it's well worth it to just get a loan because it's expensive to move a big safe. Oh, it is. Or just and leave it's, it. It's, it's worth, you have Blow to. Blow it in place. It's not, it's not a safe, it's not a good thing to move. No. Um, when that happened, obviously I can't work now. Uh, my checking account went off for another five grand from Black Rifle. Super confused by it. Reached out to Evan. I was like, hey dude, y'all already paid me for the last run of bag openers. And he was like, no homie. He goes, that's for upcoming projects. He goes, I love you. I know you're in a lot of pain that should help you. And uh, that's the money that floated me for those three months oh, while man. I was down. Um, that's awesome. because of what I did when I went in for my, uh, checkup, uh, I was six months ahead of schedule on my healing. The doctor looked at my x-rays, came back in and he was like, <clears throat> dude, I don't, this doesn't seem right. He goes, can yeah. I ask you a few questions? He was like, uh, do you smoke? And I was like, no, sir. I uh, quit smoking cigarettes about three years ago. He's like, do you do any THC, CBD, any of that? And I was like, well, actually, yes, I do. I only medicated with that. He goes, so you didn't do any painkillers, any muscle relaxers, anything. And I was like, no, sir. And he kind of smiled and he kind of closed the door of the office. He goes, the only time we see recoveries like this is when people don't touch the pharmaceuticals. And he goes, you're six months ahead. You'll be walking in about a month. And uh, Mm. I was back working four months and they told me I wouldn't be able to walk for six and I wouldn't be working for a year. Imagine if you'd taken all that stuff and just got, I was just stuck on my couch and I guess my body body just went through the pain and just healed. But imagine if you just kept taking all that. Well, apparently the muscle relaxers I learned set you back months because it, it's not, your body's not going through the pain and your body's not actually healing. Hmm. It's slowing that process down. Okay. <clears throat> it's where if you just let your body naturally heal without that, it, yeah, it's going to be painful, but it heals almost double. Hmm. So, uh, yeah, after that, the business, thanks God to, uh, Evan and keeping me afloat business started doing better, went to drops, which is what I still do to this do to this day. Um, when I got my wife back, uh, when I got my wife back, uh, within a week, Evan hit me up and was like, dude, family's back together. Cause he wanted me to go to Texas and be black down there. Out there. And then when my wife and I separated, which is one of the hardest conversations I ever had with him, I was like, Hey man, my family's staying here in Georgia. I can't do this. And I was like, I've wanted to work with you for as long as I can remember since I found out about you. I can't, I can't leave my family. I have to be here for mm-hmm. my daughters. And he was like, man, I don't care about that. He goes, we can do rad stuff regardless. Oh, he goes, I'll work with you wherever you are. That's awesome. So once I get my nice family Evan. back. Well yep. done, buddy. Once I got my family back, he wasted no time and was like, get out here. So we flew out here. My wife was never going to leave Georgia. Um, we saw the property and everything. She saw what it did to me mm-hmm. and what I was missing. And uh, yeah, she ate a bullet and she was like, let's do it. So uh, three months later, packed up everything and moved out here and have been a part of Black Rifle ever since. Amazing. That's awesome. Navy Federal Credit Union. Navy Federal Credit Union is here to help military members and their families tackle home ownership during this high rate market. With their new no refi rate drop option, if you buy your next home now and mortgage rates drop later, you could lower your rate by paying a low fee instead of refinancing and paying thousands in closing costs. They offer mortgage options with zero down payment, so you don't need to wait years to save. Also, planning any travel this summer? Navy Federal Flagship Credit Card treats members to our highest rewards and premium benefits. Flagship makes it easy to rack up rewards with higher points on travel, including everything from tolls to terminals. Earn a bonus 40,000 points when you spend 4,000 in the first 90 days. Plus, enjoy a free year of Amazon Prime. At Navy Federal, our members are the mission. Learn more at NavyFederal.org. 
Federally insured by NCUA, membership required. Equal housing lender. Terms and conditions apply. Loans subject to approval and eligibility requirements. Open to the armed forces, the DOD, veterans, and their families. As of 5-1-2023, the rates for flagship are 14.74% to 18% based on credit worthiness. ATM fees for cash advances are up to $1 at non-Navy Federal ATMs, a $49 annual fee for Visa Signature Flagship rewards navyfederal.org so you guys make the move to utah yep. i think i come down and see you not too long after you get here see the shop i know yeah. it's morphed a little bit it was right before time. the terminal list popped out was that when you moved no that's when uh, you came down uh it was right because i'll never forget we were sitting eating lunch and you showed us the <clears throat> you showed us a little the excerpt video? from it ah, that nice. hadn't been seen yet. That was nice, super exciting. Nice. Uh, so yeah, your setup down there was was really cool. Thank you. Um, and a I lot of that goes to my shopmate Tori Gunstone Creations. Nice, nice. He uh, is one of the br- most brilliant humans I've ever met. How did you guys link up? I have one of his blades right over here. Oh yeah, somewhere. Um, one of his ballistics uh, has the has yeah. I think is that what it is? Yep. Oh, beautiful. Yep. Yeah. One. I mean, his epoxy is one of the best epoxy guys around, and he's the one that created the ballistic scales and. Such a rad dude. So I saw him on Instagram, actually. <clears throat> saw him on Instagram when I still lived in Georgia. Loved his stuff. We just started talking through social media because obviously I don't have a problem talking. And uh, I'm just pretty much pretty outgoing when it comes yeah. to that. Reached out to him. was like, dude, love your stuff. He uh, helped me with a couple Kydex questions at the time. I was learning how to do Kydex. And then uh, I was already friends with everyone at Black Rifle. And I was like, hey, dude, I kind of want to do this Black Rifle collab. You want to do this with me? And he was like, dude, I love Black Rifle. I'd, I'd love, and he didn't even realize that I knew everyone. He just mm. thought we would make something, send it off, fingers crossed. Mm. But uh, obviously, I didn't know everyone. And he was like, "Wait, you actually know them?" I was like, "Yeah, let's do a really cool collaboration, and let's instead of doing bullets, let's put like coffee beans in the handle and do this. I'll make the blade, you do the handle. Mm. We'll find a leather guy and a photographer, and uh, found an amazing leather maker out of Texas, Joey with Imperial Leather Works. Okay. And then Josh Rollerson was the photographer. Yeah." Yeah. all three that's his uh, ak right there yep yeah so uh all three guy, all these guys i just found on social media reached out to all of them pitched them this wild idea and um they were like we're in so i made the blade send them off to tory in washington which is where he's from which mm. is why we're moving okay uh send it off to washington he did the handles uh send it off to joey he did the sheaths and then they went awesome. up to virginia where josh did the shoot uh put them up I had never had anything really take off yet. And for some reason, when those knives came up, it just blew up. Um, We did a auction on them, which we thought would be the easiest way to do it because we didn't know really know how to price them. And uh, they ended up going for just under eight grand, Nice. which for all of us, I think my highest knife I had charged at the time was $200. And uh, we were all pretty shook. And uh, it was, it went from six grand to eight in a matter of 30 seconds because there were three people that were bidding on it and um, ended up that a girl who was in Afghanistan, a soldier out there is the one that won it, um, was super sketched out at first because we couldn't figure out because when I reached out to her to tell her she won, I was like, Hey, uh, how do I get a hold of you? And she's like, can we talk on WhatsApp? And I was like, man, this is a scammer. They didn't really, uh, <clears throat> they didn't really they weren't taking it seriously. And she's like, no, I'm in Afghanistan. And she's like, it's really late right now. Can you call me? And I was like, sure. I was like, I'm not prying, but you're a soldier and you're a specialist. Like, how do you have seven grand? She's like, well, I've been out here. I'm in communications. I've been here for almost two years. And she goes, I'm sitting on a decent bit of money and I just wanted to support a veteran business. Oh, wow. And she goes, I found you, reached out to the other two guys that were just normal dudes that wanted the knife. Mm. Explain them the whole story. And I was like, hey, it's actually, because I felt bad because I hadn't set up sniper rules in auction. So a lot of times people will wait to put a bid at the last second okay. and try to snipe that from someone. So when you do auctions, you'll say, hey, last bid, has to stand for three minutes. I didn't know that rule yet. So everybody placed those last bids at the very last second. So we didn't really, it was so close. It was hard to tell who actually got it. So we all agreed it was her. So now I had to call these other two guys and tell them, hey, sorry, you didn't win the knife. Thank God it was her story. One of those guys goes, 
no kidding. Turns out he's a franchisee for Black Rifle. <laughs> and he was like, I don't really want anyone to know what my name is or anything like that. And uh, he was like, I'm not letting this soldier pay for that. So he paid for the, her knife, the $7,000 paid for her knife. And then she ended up giving that money now that she wasn't giving me to another veteran business. Oh, and wow. this just started this weird chain reaction with my work where at least once a month, somebody will buy a blade for me for some reason. And they'll go, Hey, I bought that. Don't worry about mailing it to me. Save that for someone who needs a knife. Wow. And it's just created this really weird thing that all started with that collaboration. Now, Tori's my best friend. Imperial leather work is one of the greatest leather guys around. Josh works for black rifle and is one of our leading designers. Wow. So everybody out of that, is absolutely crushing it in life. When I got the shop at Black Rifle, realized it was a little too big for me. Uh, felt kind of guilty about having an amazing space like that when there's so many makers I know that are really trying hard and just mm -hmm. can't catch a break. Yeah. And uh, I reached out to Tori and I was like, hey dude, uh, any chance you would wanna come down here and visit? They came, stayed with us for five days in our really tiny house at the time didn't argue like we got along so great and i was like man if i can hang out with you for five days with all our families because he has two sons mm. and his wife i was like there's something pretty special here and on a whim i was like you want to move your family out of washington and move down here and move in my shop he talked with his wife and two months later he moved down here okay. and uh when he got here because of the level of resin he does he has to have a pretty clean shop and uh i ripped everything out of the shop we laid epoxy floors so when oh, he wow. got there it was a completely clean slate there no was way. nothing in that shop and uh we built it out the way he needed for his business to be successful and it took that old school blacksmith mentality that most blacksmiths have of just our shops look like your office just a train wreck stuff everywhere <laughs> papers throwing stuff like it's just it's yeah. a lot you kind of know where everything is but it's a lot of chaos mm -hmm. he's incredibly ocd and now like every single process i'm cleaning up between it i'm doing this and that's honestly when everything really started taking off mm -hmm. because just my brain was clearer being having someone in the shop that was five years ahead of me in the knife world and blacksmithing mm -hmm. having that little bit of competition little bit of like motivation just pushed my work even harder. Mm. And he has one of the most beautiful brains of anyone I've met to where I'm the kind of guy, I'll buy it. Find something I like, I'll buy it, just get me working. He's the kind of brain that he builds everything. Yeah. He wards everything, everything. And if he sees something, he goes, how can I make this faster? Me, I'll kind of get in a rhythm and I just stick with it. He's always evolving and always changing, which for us, I'm a little bit more outgoing and more of the people person. Mm -hmm. He's more of the brains in the shop. Yeah. And it was the absolute perfect mesh along with him just turning into one of my best friends. And uh, yeah, so the move stemmed with, uh, they have a beautiful house out in Washington with five acres. He had a massive shop out there, which he was only utilizing like a fourth of it. Mm. And uh, came in the shop a couple months ago and was like, hey, the wife's really missing her family and home and everything. We're going to head back after our rent is up. Amazing. Being at Black Rifle has been the greatest thing that's ever happened in my business. And <clears throat> I will continue to do stuff with Black Rifle for as long as the company exists. And I love everybody there and all my friends and family. And we're just ready for the next chapter. Uh, having so many people around is one of the big perks i get to see you when you stop by and whoever evan's podcasting with but i lose about eight or nine hours of work a week <laughs> with conversations oh, talking yeah. people uh -huh. and i also notice like i'm good at talking and I, I don't mind talking to people but i am a bit of an introvert and uh like after this i'll go home and sit and hang with my wife and just kind of be quiet for the rest of the day yeah um I realized very quickly that when I got home, it was just like, I'm pretty burned out. Right. A lot of my friendships, old school friendships back home and stuff don't really exist much anymore just because I talk so much throughout the day mm. and I'm dealing with so many people. And, you know, the other cool thing about Black Rifle is you, someone like you could walk in and be like, dude, I love your work. Obviously, I want to work with you but you're the 10th person this week right. to do that. <laughs> so now I'm just like, right. 
very quickly, I overpromised a lot because I would just want to say yes. I don't want to say no. Yeah. This year is my first year of learning how to say no. Yeah. And that, just, I, I got to work on that no, as well. No, not just no, maybe not yet. Yeah. Yes, I want to do something. Yes, I would love nothing more. But if I say yes right now, I might ruin this friendship because I'm just not ready to mentally. And I have one employee, yeah. which I'm losing with the move. Yeah. So I'm going to go back to just me making all the knives man and how does a how does the drop work because like when i see that there's a drop coming i know i instantly know that i can't do it because there's so many things going on so i can't be there's just no time for me to be ready to like yep. get that button at the last second you know type of thing um so how does the drop work do you still go on and order it normally but it's just like now they're so, available so the way i do those is once uh, I recovered from breaking my back, I stopped doing custom orders. Custom orders is normally how knife makers have to start making knives because mm -hmm. you kind of have to make what a client wants mm -hmm. because you don't have a style or a look yet or mm -hmm. something people want. Right. <clears throat> I've been very blessed to kind of gain a weird style that is mine. You can see my blades pretty far away and know mm -hmm. it's my work. And I got to a place where there was just enough of a demand that I could start making what I love. Yeah. I only make what I wanna make. And then I, Monday, I go in, decide what I'm gonna make for that week, I'll make it, and then I put it on the website, normally Sundays at noon, and uh, first come, first serve. And that's, and that's it. What, what are the smaller ones that you're making right now? Like the, the muskrat. Yeah, those are awesome. Yeah, so that's my new, besides the Revenant, so, that's one of the hardest things to do in knife making is find like a niche, find like a, uh -huh. like Tories, the ballistic scales and his baby sharks, like, you know, Winklers, the Tomahawks, like you gotta have one of those one or two blades. Like the Revenant is the one that will yeah. never leave. Yeah. And that's another thing that's made my blades a little bit more of a collector item is once I don't want to make a design anymore, that's it. no matter how much people want to buy it, pay for it, whatever, I'm just really not interested in making it as long as I'm blessed to be able to get to make what I want to make. And then this thing. So I saw you put this up and I, I uh, instantly, I think, texted you and was like, oh man, dude, can you make me one of those? And you're like, it's already yours. It's already, this is already done. <laughs> yeah, I was actually already have, I was, the tomahawk was done and I was working on the knife. Amazing. Look at that. So right there, people can, can see these are beautiful. I mean, absolutely. Well, and incredible. speaking of muskrats. Oh, no way, dude. How did you know? I figured it had been Man. a while since I had made you something Gosh. and I've come a little bit. I'm very blessed to be getting to work with some of the coolest blacksmiths dude. around and slowly building up my craft. And look at that. For those that are watching, I'm not sure where that camera's right there. Look at that. I love that little wax. Uh, That'll never go away. Seal right I there. Hope we never should I break it or many. should I, what, should I uh, open it? Ask, oh, you've got enough. You can break that one. All I'm right, sure right, you've got right, a good right. one tucked away somewhere. Man, that's awesome. Well, there we go. I got. Thank you. This is... Because when I saw when I saw that you were doing these, I was like, "Oh, I need I need to reach out. I need to get one and just finish the book." So I'm like doing Muskrat's it. probably my favorite things. favorite blade I make right now. I wanted Man. to make more of an EDC so people didn't have to carry these big ones. And oh, yours oh, is oh, a oh. little special. Really? Let me see what we got going on here. Uh, that's it. Nice. Look at that. So Man. on yours, you have a hundred layer or 117 layer Damascus core what? with 15 and 20 sandwich with high carbon steel on the outside. What? So essentially it's a Gomai blade, but it's not technically Gomai because Gomai, Gomai is five pieces of steel and the core I used is Damascus. What? This so you didn't awesome. have a fancy one of mine. I've never done anything beautiful on yours man. and figured it was time to you have a little Thank bit of you. a fancier blade Thank with a really you. pretty redwood burl handle. Man, I've been seeing you post these and I'm like, I just gotta, you know, figure out how to order one. And I see the drops coming and I'm like juggling a gazillion things. So I haven't been able to oh, do stop. that. So man, Thank you. This is a beautiful knife. But once again, this is something that it's one you of can my favorite. see. It's one of and my I know favorite it's yours. Patterns. You know, I see this. I don't need to like look and see whose this is. Just like with these, I don't need to like look and see whose blade this is. I know. And it's funny because I actually made yours three weeks ago. Really? And not that one. I made yours three weeks ago. And then because like a lot of times when you're doing Damascus, Samai, Gomai, you don't really know how the pattern's going to come out, mm. especially since I'm so new to doing those processes. And uh, that's my favorite pattern that I've ever done. And when I made it, I knew that was the one you had to have. Oh, man. So I actually Thank sold you. the one I made you and ended up 
saving that one for no you because I was just way. I knew you had to have that, that one. That is too cool. Amazing. I mean, who's doing who's doing this All for me. you? That's you, man. Yep, and on that Incredible. one, we Incredible. did our for those. So a buddy of mine, because I, I buy a lot of knives as well. I'm a big fan of supporting all my friends. Mm. So uh, I buy a lot of knife makers knives, which not a lot of blacksmiths do. I kind of saw that. I saw a lot of people like to give you a lot of advice in the knife community, uh. but no one ever supports your work. So for me, it's a big deal for me to buy my friend's work because it's like, I can't ever say anything if you're not actually supporting the person you're trying yeah. to talk to. Right. And uh, so one of my buddies, he does sheaths like that. Yeah. Seth Lopez, um, actually a seal out of Cali, uh, Seth Lopez Blade Works, and um, unbelievable bladesmith. And he does a lot of knives like that uh, with that kind of sheath. So you just take the 550 cord, yeah. loop it through, through your belt loop, and you could drop the knife in your pocket in the sheath. That handle sits nice and tight on the corner of your pocket. So when you grab it, you just pull it and the sheath pops right off. Nice. And I just loved, I loved that. Asked him if it was cool, if I kind of did the same thing. So all the muskrats just loop that paracord through your belt, drop it in your pocket, and then you just reach in, just pop that off and you got your knife. Man, that is awesome. Man, that one you have on right there, I've seen you. Uh, That's a, yeah. This is one of my old ones. Okay, yeah, I've seen this you show is, that one before. So back when I was just talking about when we were broke and everything was down. So the second hidden tang I ever made, and I love doing these scout carries across the hip where uh -huh. the antler rolls around. That's one of my little weird things okay. I like to do. I've done about 10 knives like this now. This is the first one I ever did, and it was my favorite knife I ever made. And I even, even on the post on Instagram when I did it, I said, I'm really upset I have to sell this, but we're too broke. One day I hope I can buy it back. Wow. Bought it back a year ago. No Took way. Me, it, had, it had transferred from four different people. How did you track it down? So I put a, originally I reached out to the guy who did it. He gave me this whole sob story about how it was stolen. Turned out it was, he, so he told me it was stolen. So I put something up on my Instagram saying, hey, if anyone sees this knife, I'd love to get it back. Turns out he didn't get stolen. He had put it on one of a, there, I guess there's a bunch of Grizzly Forge supporter pages where hmm. people trade. I'm not on awesome. Facebook at all. But there's three subgroups on Facebook of Grizzly Forge Blades where people buy and trade my blades. And uh, a gentleman on there reached out to me and was like, hey man, I actually had that knife. That guy sold it to me, but I don't have it anymore. I traded it for another one of your knives. Well, I actually, cause I'm not as good as you. I don't ever go in my DMs. I actually went in my DMs and got another DM from a guy who was like, hey, is this your knife? And it was, and he was like, I got it from this person who got it from this person no way. and didn't even charge me to oh, get it back. He was like, man. I just want you to have it back. Oh, so I so made cool. him another like an updated nice blade. And this is one of some of my older work and everything, but it's the blade I carry 90% of the time no just kidding. because like I loved this knife. It felt so good. I loved how it looked. And I told myself one day I'd get it back. No way. And uh, it's one of three oh. knives of mine I own. <laughs> Amazing. Oh, too cool. Man, I love it. This is a uh, thank you. This means so Absolute much to me. I pleasure. really appreciate it. Thank you, it. brother. Like, Man, it's rad to be here. It's been amazing to see all your success. I oh. absolutely love the books, and it's thank been you. amazing to get to call you a friend all these years now. Thank and, you. you know, you helped me create literally my best selling blade and the Revenant. And it's been amazing to be tied to your legacy. And uh, oh, it means man. the world. You've. You've done a lot. I don't think you realize how much you do for, you know, knife makers and just the community in general with how you share our gear and talk about what we do and, you know, really show people there's still guys out there making stuff by hand. And oh, man. I hope you realize the impact you have on people. And it is truly an honor to get to it's, it. I had no idea I had made you that many blades. It's so <laughs> cool to see. Yeah. And I mean, you literally have some of my first year's work. Oh, that's so amazing. It's, it's really cool to get to see that and see the support you've done. You don't have to do any of this. And it's oh, really amazing. Amazing you do. Well, I really appreciate it. It's honor support. to get to call and, you a uh, friend. Oh, thanks, brother. And the one thing I, we couldn't find because we used it in a little uh, photo shoot out here is my steak flipper. One of uh, seven. One of seven. One of seven. Nice. Yeah, I'm Man. actually going to bring those back soon. Nice. Those yeah. are awesome. I know. Those, oh, so cool. Um, I saw that immediately. I think that's one of the ones I was like, okay, maybe I saw that it was going to be a one of, I don't know. Anyway, yeah, I, no, I reached I out did. right away. No, I was like, I think hold I that posted, for me. I think it was only three and you were like, I've got to have one. And I was like, again, <laughs> anytime I do something special or different, I know I got to send you one. Oh, so I, again, I already had it made and I was like, I already got you one done. Oh, too cool. But we're too hoping cool. to do a lot more of that kind of stuff soon. Instagram's got a little weird lately. Hmm. Oh, about uh, knife I'm a advertising deadly, or like, deadly weapons. So uh, I'm going to start getting into the chef knife game here once nice. I get out. I'm actually moving to put me in away. for a set. 
I'm moving in 10 minutes away from the world's greatest chef knife maker, Mareka Mamalsi, uh, mm. who is the best Damascus maker and one of the best chef knife makers in the world is 10 minutes from me. No way. So I am beyond excited to get to spend some time with him and get in the cooking world a little bit. Try mm. to shift it up a little bit. Try to mm -hmm. be able to do cooking cutleries a little bit better. Mm. And uh, Instagram's gotten a little weird and it's kind of affected the business a touch mm. just because I make deadly weapons. Right. And uh, But we're adapting and adjusting and pivoting a little bit and hopefully getting the Still going to do all my normal stuff, but start tossing in some chef knives and some cooking stuff here. So nice. Really excited to go down awesome. that rabbit hole. Awesome. And so with Instagram being a little weird, is that uh, still the best place for people to find out that it's you're doing only, a drop? Yeah. Or? yeah. So uh, we do actually the best is the website. So okay. sign up for the website, the email list. We literally only send out an email Saturday night and it shows all the knives that are going to be in the drop. So okay. you have a little bit of heads up of what you're looking for. Yep. Shows all the knives and what time they're dropping. And so you just go there right at that time and uh, bam, try to be yep, one of the first people. Just be on the website. 12 o'clock on Sundays. Down. It's slowed down a little bit. Uh, I've had knives on there now for a few hours. So <laughs> it has slowed down a little bit just because people sadly just can't really see my work right now. Instagram. Mm. Uh, Scram's hitting us pretty hard when it comes to that. I Come on, Instagram. Come on. I know, but it's, the program. I, you know, I can't bitch about it. It yeah. is what it is. I can only just try to adapt and right. figure out better ways to get my work out there. Exactly. But uh, yeah, that's been a little tough. But uh, besides that, yeah, dude drops almost every single Sunday. Mm -hmm. uh, I announce it throughout the week on my Instagram. And then uh, the email goes out Saturday nights to give everyone the full preview of what's hitting the website. I wonder if it'd be a little different with chef knives or if they just all go in the same Complete, category. No, completely different because mm -hmm. uh, chef knives are cooking cutlery. Yeah. Mine for some weird reason. This could be cooking cutlery. I, I could chop something with this. Well, the problem to is eat? it's not even the knife. I'm not making anything that doesn't pass. It's that the AI that runs everything on mm -hmm. Instagram flags it as fantasy weapons. Huh. So you're not allowed to have uh, swords, fantasy weapons, explosives, uh, or gun sales. And for some reason, whatever AI they're using is flagging that I can go in and fight it and argue with it, but it takes two months for that to get approved. And yeah. once it's cleared, one of my previous posts will automatically get flagged because it can only flag five at a time. And I constantly have five flagged. So I can go back and delete the whole post, which I have done, but all it does is wait 24 hours and flag the next five. Yeah. So essentially it would delete my Instagram. Oh wow. So I just kind of don't really know who I who I pissed off over there to pop yeah. up on their radar, but hey, you adapt and you figure out how to keep cruising. Exactly, what else can you do, <laughs> you know? Man, well, I'm fired up for your next chapter. Thank you, brother. And I uh, love to come visit out there and see the shop when you're up and running. And uh, man, this thing is beautiful. Thank you so much. I've been thinking about this since I first saw you uh, posted a little while ago. So sincerely appreciated. Thank, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for having me on. It's been an absolute pleasure to get to sit across from you and chop it up. That's what I love most about the podcast is being able to turn the phone off and uh, not be in front of the computer for a little bit and just get to catch up. So uh, thanks so much for everything. And actually, let's do a little gear segment and talk about all these things one more oh, time. Yeah, Let's do it. Awesome, brother. Black Rifle Coffee Company. You can help Black Rifle Coffee raise $1 million to benefit veterans through the boot campaign. All you need to do is grab a can of ready-to-drink coffee online or from your local grocery or convenience store. The Boot Campaign is one of the most renowned veteran-focused nonprofits in the country, working tirelessly to provide life-changing aid and benefits to service members and their families. Join forces with Black Rifle in the Boot Campaign from May through the end of the year, where every can of ready-to-drink coffee you buy will contribute to making this massive donation possible. Black Rifle Ready to Drink Coffee is available in several great tasting flavors on the Black Rifle Coffee website at your local convenience or grocery store. And no matter where you are, you can fuel your caffeine fix while supporting veterans. Every time you crack open a can of Ready to Drink, you'll be making a huge difference in the lives of veterans and their families. Black Rifle Coffee is committed to serving the veteran community. And with your help, we can all continue to make a difference. Let's raise a can together to keep fueling Americans for a good cause. Check out blackriflecoffee.com slash danger close and use code danger close 20 at checkout for 20% off your purchase and your first coffee club order. Blackriflecoffee.com slash danger close. Drink up.
Welcome to the gear highlight portion of the Danger Close podcast here with Lucas O'Hara of Grizzly Forge. And we're going to run through some blades right here. We talked about some on the podcast, but uh, run through these for me right here. I know we have one of the, the first, the bag opener yeah. right here you did for Black Rifle. And we just talk about these a little bit. Yeah, so this was uh, first one of 10 wow. of the BRCC bag openers we did. Nice. Uh, actually, I think you got number four, if All I remember right. correctly. And then nice. this was the first Revenant nice. that I ever made. Uh, designed this blade specifically for you when uh, cool. you reached out to me, telling me you wanted a blade. I knew we had to do something special. Yeah. Been a lot of uh, a lot of evolutions of this since. And fun fact: this is one of the only ones that's double stamped, oh, where nice. you have my maker's mark and Black Rifle on it. Nice. So I stopped double stamping because I noticed that a lot of times it would take away. The stamp on the other side because oh. you're hammering on it. Oh, gotcha. So uh, that's a fun little fun nice thing you have there. Nice. <clears throat> and then this was the newer set. Uh, this is back when I was still uh, whitewashing or not doing anything to the blade. Okay. So all my blades now have a texture on it ah. because I acid etch and then tumble all my blades. Okay. So all of them are rock tumbled. So this is another cool way to date your blade that it doesn't have any of the rock tumble. Nice. So this would probably be Revenant Evolution, maybe four. Okay. And what's the uh, what's the handle on this one? This one's Buckeye Burl. Beautiful. So hardwoods are probably my favorite thing to get to use. Um, my handles are, I almost like doing even more than the knife. Mm. Really, really, especially lately, I've been getting into a little bit more high-end woods. Yeah. And I uh, matched on this the same block of wood. Nice. So, and talk about, talk about, where did this come from, this design? So right the there. Tomahawk, uh, I mean, I went through maybe 15 different iterations trying to find one that I liked. I wanted to do a full tang tomahawk just because the old school ones, I am going to get into those eventually, but the handle can snap, they can break mm -hmm. off, and then you're just stuck with a head. Okay. Worst case scenario, if for some reason you were to smash these handles off, you still have a tomahawk. Yeah. So no matter what, you still have a piece that's usable. And uh, uh, instead of stamping these with the maker's mark, had my maker's mark water jetted out of uh, the back. Where your claws are these nice little fun spikes on the back. I know those spikes are brutal. Right yeah, there. they're pretty gnarly. Man, that's awesome. We've done yeah. some tests with some ballistic dummies and stuff. Oh, it's, nice. It's pretty crazy. Oh, yeah. I got to do some ballistic dummy stuff down uh, there. I shot through it uh, for, which book was it? For uh, either Savage Sun or The Devil's Hand. I forget which one. I think The Devil's Hand. But went down there and, uh, and shot with my bow through some ballistic dummies. Those things are pretty cool. Yeah, so it is a lot of fun, but uh, and actually use one of my Winkler Hawks on one, uh, but yeah, look at that, how beautiful that is! Gosh, Thank amazing, you. amazing. And then what about these two right here? And then this was like I was saying on the podcast. This was one of my first uh, hidden tangs I did, and these I like to do. I like to find the stag that molds around. So I like mm. to do front scout carry where that handle is going to make a nice profile around your side. Yeah, just kind of hard to find tips that look mm -hmm. this good. But yeah, that was uh, my s maybe fifth or sixth hidden tang I ever did and loved it so much, but was in, I was so poor that I had to sell it and uh, was able to find it and buy it back just a few years ago Crazy. or actually a year ago. Amazing. Amazing. And then leather on this one, uh, Joey at Imperial Leatherwork, okay. once I found the knife, sent it off and he made an absolutely beautiful sheath for me. Yeah. To mount that. And that then is this is your newest baby. Yeah. Look at that. <clears throat> so this is my newest design. Uh, this is the muskrat. I make a lot of bigger blades, mm. which I personally enjoy carrying. I am a bigger human. Um, a lot of people don't like walking around with a big knife on their side. Yeah. So I needed to have something that was a little bit more concealable, EDC, carry yeah. around, which is why we came up with this. Nice. Uh, this one's got Damascus core, 15 and 20 nickel on the side, and then roll up to your high carbon steel on that. So awesome. With a redwood handle. Yeah, you really surprised me with this. I was not expecting that, but I've been seeing you post about it and been wanting to get one, but I've been so so busy. So this was really special. I Thank really, you. really appreciate it. And then on these, Super we cool. do little bitty kydex. Uh, all you like to do, take your loop, run it around your belt loop, drop the knife mm -hmm. in your pocket, and then when you go to grab it, just pops right off. Dang. And then all the muskrats come with that. So awesome. <clears throat> so and then awesome. I'm going to shout it out because I love him. My shot mate, yeah. Tori Gunstone Creations. Nice. He is one of the best epoxy and resin guys yeah. around. Um, he is the one that came up with the ballistic scales. You will not find anyone that can get clearer epoxy or just a clearer shadow through their yeah. work. And uh, he makes so absolutely cool. beautiful stuff. And it was pumped. I was pumped to see one of his blades in here. So. Yep. And now you guys are both headed to uh, to Washington State, set up shop up there, and just do keep doing awesome stuff. Man, and what's his what's his uh, Instagram? Gunstone Creations. Gunstone Creations. A website yep. too. Gunstone, yep. Gunstone just Creations pop right across up. the board. And then you have one other blade on you. 
Oh, yes, I do. Actually, this has been my EDC for almost five years ago. Um, one of my favorite makers, and one of the reasons I got into knife making is a company called Bearing Made. Um, they do William Skagel style blades. So there was a maker way back in the day called William Skagel. This was his design. It would be like if in 40 years I pass away and die, somebody paid homage to me and kind of took mine. He mm -hmm. created a style of blade. Wow. And uh, Barry made, um, there are a few other companies. Uh, his dad actually, Treeman Knives, they all kind of stick with the Skagel style, okay. which is one of my favorite blades. Awesome. And um, yeah, I've been carrying this one for almost four years now. And they just do these really nice little in the pocket sheaths that yeah. I'm a huge fan of. Nice. But yeah, they do absolutely unbelievable great work. Awesome. Awesome, man. And we also have the same watch on, very similar. Little little Aries right there. And yeah, there you go. Yeah. Nice. Got the Grizzly Forge on yours. I got the cross tomahawks on mine. And yeah, mine does look a lot bigger than For yours. Really? Just because my my yeah, just because my wrist is smaller. Is that true? Put yours together. Put it right there. Can we tell? I don't know. I was like, it really did seem know. like... We'll have to ask Matt Graham. Mine might be bigger. <laughs> I don't know. Our wrists aren't that big. I mean, you're... But yeah, I was very blessed to do a collaboration with nice. them uh, a few months ago. And uh, with Tori teaching me how he does his, I was able yeah. to lay all the watch parts inside the handle. Oh, no way. Yep. So we did nice. all the watch parts inside, uh, all the mechanisms Oh, I saw that inside. that was going down yep. somewhere. And yeah, then did amazing. a run of matching watches to go with them. Nice. So we've actually got another one of those coming out in a few months. That so another five cool. watches, another five knives. Nice. What band do you have on there? Uh, this is just their OD green one. Okay. It's just, we've been wearing yours. This one's coming oh, this yeah. one just came out this week. So uh, with the cross tomahawk. So this is, uh, this is up right now. I'm sure that maybe, well, they'll probably be gone by the time this podcast. Probably. I'm going to go ahead and guess. <laughs> they were uh, looking pretty slim when I jumped on there last night. <laughs> nice, man. Nice. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thanks for coming down and doing this. Absolutely. Brother. Appreciate it. And, uh, yeah, uh, grizzlyforge.com. Yes, Grizzly Check them out. These Instagram. things all drop on Sunday, so sign up for the newsletter. It'll uh, That newsletter comes out Saturday night just to prep you for Sunday at noon when mm -hmm. these things drop. So if you want one, you got to be quick. Yes, sir. And if you're awesome. looking for me on Instagram, it is grizzly underscore forge. If you do not put that underscore in, you will not find me. So, And you probably have to type it in exactly because these things, yep. very dangerous weapons right here. Yes, and, they are. Uh, and you might have to type it in exactly to find you or link over from uh, grizzlyforge.com. Yes, sir. Awesome. Thanks, brother. Always. Thank you for tuning in to the Danger Close podcast, an Ironclad original presented by Navy Federal Credit Union. My latest novel, Only the Dead, is on shelves right now. To find out more about Lucas O'Hara and Grizzly Forge, go to thegrizzlyforge.com and follow him on Instagram at grizzly underscore forge. And be sure and sign up for that newsletter to find out about those Sunday knife drops. Follow me on the social channels at Jack Carr USA officialjackcar.com. That is the website. Click on shop in the upper right-hand corner for the merch. And if you enjoyed this conversation, be sure to leave a five-star rating and review wherever you get your podcasts. Until the next time, take care out there, stay safe, be strong, keep fighting.